Welcome to The Necessary Entrepreneur. On this week's episode, we welcome Neil Hoffman, a shark tanker, CEO of Fan Roll by Metallic Dice Games, and creator of Minch on a Bench, the most publicized brand to ever come out of Shark Tank. Minch on a Bench, it started as a way to bring more Funica to Hanukkah. I know that's fun to say. Fan Roll Dice creates high-end accessories and experiences for tabletop gaming market through creativity and innovation. Neil and I got a pleasure to talk about when the idea hit for Minch on a Bench. It's an awesome conversation and story, so wait for that. The struggle to make it happen and pitching it on Shark Tank. Neil also talks about buying and marketing fan roll dice, failing small, not fearing rejection, knowing what you're good at, learning your breaking point, also taking strategic risks, which was awesome, having expandable capacity, and the importance of community and sticking together. But my favorite part of the conversation was when he talks about knowing where to make money and then where to make a difference. It's special to my heart. Hey, thanks for tuning in to The Necessary Entrepreneur. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe so we can continue delivering outstanding content. I hope you love this one as much as we did. So hey Neil Hoffman, welcome. Well, thank you. <laughs> it's um, you're it's nice to find people here in Cincinnati and to come in studio and to have a podcast, and especially with people that design um things, which we'll talk about mention on the bench and all this. Did, was it supposed to look like you? No, no, it was <laughs> kind of inspired by my grandfather. <laughs> Nobody wants to buy a doll that looks like me. <laughs> Um, do you think it was in the back of your head when you were designing it? It's like, I don't want it to look like me, but it still comes out looking like you. Uh, I've insulted you twice already. Uh, yeah, in the no, beginning. I mean, listen, I started 10 years ago, so he's starting to look more like me over the 10 years <laughs> as my hair gets gray and I put on weight. Yeah, those um, those videos on YouTube and all the stuff on your social, you look a little different now. Yeah, no, I, it's been 10 years. It's It's been a long 10 years. <laughs> so what's going on, man? 2023, what's on your mind with the entrepreneurial stuff happening and things happening in the world and a family and all that what's going on what's on neil's mind in 2023 yeah well first of all thanks for having me yeah i'm, I'm gonna start back like 2012 when i moved when i was in cincinnati and i quit my job and i was doing entrepreneurship and i was lonely and i didn't realize that there was this entrepreneurship group and there were other people who were doing their hustles in Cincinnati um, and what a community it was. And now as I look at the people that you've interviewed and how many I know, uh, it's so cool that this ecosystem exists in Cincinnati. Uh, yeah, what's on my mind? So uh, 10 years into Mensch. Uh, so Mensch on a Bench, the Jewish elf on a shelf, successfully uh, – inspired while working through Nordstrom, walking through Nordstrom's in Kenwood Mall. Uh, my son asked for an elf on a shelf. I said, you could have a mensch on a bench. I could tell you that whole story, but we sold a half million of those. Um, about a year and a half ago, I bought another company called Fan Roll Dice. It is in the Dungeons and Dragons tabletop gaming space. Uh, and I love it because it is people who are equally passionate about what they do and it fits my personality and for Mench and for fan roll um it's it's all about authenticity for me and i am a geeky jewish guy you meet me you know that and whether i'm doing Mench or whether i'm doing dice um people realize you know uh, i'm not pretending this is the real me <laughs> who you are what um why does authenticity matter to you i think if you're going to create a community which is what i like to do um, you have to be honest with your community. And, you know, for my dice company, I'm a geek, right? But I'm more of a comic book, video game type guy. I'm not a play Dungeons & Dragons every week kind of guy, but I respect that game. I'm close enough. I can talk the talk, and I don't pretend I'm something I'm not. And people appreciate that, right? Uh, we were talking a little bit earlier about finding people who have passions. And if you're lucky in this life you find that you have this passion and then you take a job to go after it. And there are probably people who have to go nine to fives and pursue their passion at night. And for me, I find those people in the Dungeons and Dragons world and they, they love what they're doing so much and they appreciate what I'm bringing to them. 
uh, it's really rewarding. The um, the whole passion piece. Wow, man, there's books written about it. All the big billionaire entrepreneurs talk about it. You hear some of the big names that say, um, find something that you love to do and it won't feel like work. I'm telling you, I've loved to sell real estate for 19 years. There's a lot of days it's felt like work. Yeah, I mean, any job, there's always going to be aspects of it that suck, yeah. right? So I got to do my financials. That feels like work. I have to write a list and I make myself do it. But that's like 20%. 80% for me is coming up with ideas and producing stuff and shipping stuff and doing PR. And that's the stuff I love doing. And I don't have hours, right? I just start in the morning. I go I play some video games during the day. I work at night. I work all weekend. Like it, my life is my work. Like, and my family, they're all blended together. And that's, the life I want to live. And there are plenty of people that want separation that say, look, I want nine to five and at five o'clock, I want to go and do my own thing. And I'm just not one of them. How's that separation feel for him on Monday about 7 p.m. though? Or I mean, Sunday at 7 p.m. For me or for them? No, for them. Well, like for those friends that we have, right? Yeah. That's so, you know, people talk about the Sunday scaries and I used to get those too. And I don't get that. I get the Monday excited. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, can I swear on the podcast? Yeah. Right. Listen, you open it up first, and I'm going to let go. All right, great. So, no, I, I'm like, great. The kids are fucking going back to school tomorrow. That means I can get more time to work, and I got all these ideas and all these things I want to work on. So where other people are like, oh, it's Monday morning. Remember like, remember the conversation we just had with the lady in the elevator yeah, coming up? Yeah, exactly. Did you hear what was what we were talking about? Yeah, the Tuesdays are yep. better than Mondays, and Mondays kind of stink. And my, my kids even agree. And it's like your kids agree because – you talk about it. Yeah. For the kids, you know, like, they get to enjoy their weekends, and school is so, you know, in a box. So I understand that. But when you get to be an adult, it doesn't have to be that way. So for me, it's like Sunday night, I'm writing down, here's the stuff I want to tackle tomorrow. And I'm waking up, and I'm like, thank God we're going, because all the corporate corporations I work with are now back to work. I'm like, all right, I've been thinking about this stuff all weekend, right? You guys are back. Let's do this, this, and this. When you think about all that stuff, do you what do you do? Because I find myself having some really good, what I believe, creative, great thoughts. And if I don't document them quick, I lose them. Do you or do you remember them? It's 50-50. I try and keep my phone on me and I have like old notes tab, especially when I'm laying in bed, right? Then I'll roll over and take notes because otherwise I'll forget them. Uh, but yeah, the good ones stick with you. Okay. Then you're at least for me yeah do you think do you think about it when you come up with a good one do you spend a lot of time thinking about it then right away is that why it sticks yeah it's not fleeting I, I think so and the funniest thing for me is i have so many ideas and i'm i'm always going like a million miles an hour multiple companies so i'll have an idea and i'll be like this dice advent calendar right we're doing a dice advent calendar and i want to do little toys inclusions we call them inside the dice so we are doing Six days, a Dungeon Dragon set has seven dice in it. So six of the dice have uh, reindeers in them, and the seventh has Santa Claus. So I came up with that idea, and my first Christmas item, I'm excited. I was going to say, you gave us Santa Claus? I did. I did. And next year, I'm going to put Mention there, too. Uh, is that the eighth day? What is that? <laughs> I don't know. What is it? Uh, it's going to be a special one. I haven't figured it out. Or maybe a four-sided, like a dreidel. Uh and then I forget about it, right? Like I tell somebody to do it, and then it comes back. And sometimes when I see my own ideas and I forget I had them, I fall in love with them again. I don't know if this happens to say, but I'll be like, I love that. That reindeer and Santa Claus is a set? Who came up with that? They're like, you did. I'm like, oh, I get it now. You know, be careful. Santa sat in that seat last year. That's all right. I'm not intimidated. <laughs> <laughs> be nice. Leave nice <laughs> things. Um, explain this walking through... Nordstrom's in Kenwood Town Center. And see, isn't this funny about culture? We get a culture conversation for hours, right? That your son, you, you're Jewish. Yep. But he's like, can I get Elf on a shelf? And don't you want to look at him like, no. But you said that, no, but you can have Minch on a bench. So, yeah, my life, you know, I think to understand it, there's even more behind it that I'm Jewish, my wife is Catholic. And on our second date uh, going to Graders, uh, I said to her, like, hey, you're way too cute to go out with me, way too smart to go out with me. This is awesome. But I'm going to raise my kids Jewish. So if this is a problem, like, let's not go any further. And she was like, that's cool. So 
as like we've gotten married and had kids, that's always like this chip on my shoulder that like I'm trying to raise my kids Jewish. I'm not near my family. I'm not doing as good job as I want to. It's like this constant kind of guilt weighing on me. So we're walking and and if we're getting into the real parts of it, the real, uh, I had been fired from a job, so I was unemployed and kind of depressed. And my wife was like, "Hey, we're going to the mall to go shopping. Will you come with us?" And I was like, "I don't want to go with you." And she's like, "You're not doing anything else." I'm like, eh, "I, you're the breadwinner right now. Good I, point. I go where you say." And we walked through a store. My son was like, "Brought me an elf on a shelf." And we'd seen this all over social media. It was like, "Can I have this?" I was like, "Nah, you can't have that." Uh, you can have a, and my first mind thought was Mac on a rack, like a Maccabee. And I was like, yeah, that kind of sucks. And I was like, Mitch on a bench. And I cracked myself up and literally like, as we were talking that the idea started percolating and I walked about 20 steps and then took out my phone, did a quick search. Nobody had Mitch on a bench. Nobody was doing it. You know, by the time I got home that night, I wrote, the book and what i said to myself is okay you got a cute name right but name doesn't make an idea and elf on a shelf has an idea which is the elf moves around every night by magic so what's mench's idea so I, the idea was what if this old guy watched over the oil for the jews and every night told the jews go to sleep and the miracle of hanukkah is the light lasts for eight nights and every day they wake up and they can't believe it's still lit and they teaches them a different Jewish tradition. And I was using it for my kids. Like, we're, I'm going to teach you the prayers. I'm going to teach you about dreidel. And uh, so that was the origin. And then we ended up going on vacation. Uh, it was pre-planned because I'd been fired. Yeah, I was going to say, how's this happen? No job, but still vacation. Yeah, it was pre-planned. And, and, and a good holiday season. Yeah, so we still went. I, I wanted to cancel. It was at the Atlantis. Uh, That's expensive. I know. We yeah, had been looking Bahamas. forward to that for a while. And bumped into a friend of mine from business school down there uh, who she was really smart. And the, her and her husband, me and my wife, sat by the pool for days brainstorming bench on bench. I was like, oh, we're going to have wrapping paper. We're going to have animation. We're going to do this. I'm going to go on Shark Tank. And literally, if you look at everything that's happened over the past 10 years, it all originated by the pool side. And we got back. And this is like the most important part of the story. If like there's one thing the whole podcast, listen to this, was my wife saying, Neil, you need to stop talking about it and get off your ass and do something. And I was like, okay. So I filed the trademark that night. Like she was like, you got to do it. Somebody else filed the exact same trademark two days later. So, and they couldn't do anything. They called me, they complained, they asked for it. I wouldn't give it to them. But all my wife saying, get off your ass and do something and take that first step, set off that series of events that eventually led to Shark Tank and then, you know, led to this, you know, well-known brand. So serendipity is a real thing. I, I think so. Uh, I talk about this. Uh, I go to a lot of conventions and I call it like planned serendipity where a lot of times I'm going to meet people. I don't know who. I don't know what the opportunity is. I just go in with an open mind and try and meet as many people as possible and then make friends and something will work out. And like a lot of times it does. Um, but it it that serendipity can't happen if you're sitting on your couch and you never go out, right? So is that the first time in your life when your wife did that and said, hey, quit talking about it and do something? Has that ever been is that the first time you took massive action on something like a big idea yeah i i would say on my own like first step towards my own business yeah that was that was it other than following the rules of society you yeah. know do this at this time and then this and then get married and then have kids and go to college do all this stuff even then it was just meant to be a hobby right my wife said to me she's like look you have left the toy industry so i was at hasbro toys my wife got promoted to Procter & Gamble, within Procter & Gamble, and was like, hey, you've been lead career for the past six years. It's my turn. We're going to go to Cincinnati. And, you know, I went because I wanted to be with my wife. Um, it worked out. I still have the same wife. <laughs> and I did. I took a couple jobs that weren't in the toy industry, and I really missed it. Like, I, I describe it as I was a toy guy without a toy. And she was like, if this is what you need to get your spark back, then go for it. 
because she's been so supportive, right? She's never converted. We're, you know, an interfaith household, but she's like, look, man. And I remember the conversation went, hey, can I borrow a thousand dollars from you or us? And I need to file a trademark and I need to get a logo made. And I did that and I went up to Kickstarter. I didn't even have a prototype done. Is that where you met the entrepreneurs at Kickstarter? What, what kind of, you, know, you talked about this entrepreneur network in Cincinnati. No, did I you think, start meeting them there. I think it was afterwards. And yeah. once my name got out there between Shark Tank and Kickstarter and everything else, then people started reaching out to me. Yeah. And I found there are more of these people out there. And now, you know, I work from home. I like to go out to lunch every day. If go. anybody calls me and they're like, hey, you want to grab lunch? I'm like, yeah. What are we talking about? Yeah. Like, I'll I'll say my motto is I say yes to everything. Really? Like, you reached out. And yeah. I didn't know you. And I was like, sure. Yep. What are we doing? What are we talking about? So let's get back to that later because I think there is a time you have to say no. But let's have a debate on that. I like debates. Yep. But the thousand bucks going to Kickstarter. So I... We, so she allowed you to spend $1,000. $1,000. We go to Kickstarter. We raise $22,000. Not really, because I had to put in some of my own money to get over the top. And this is where you find out where your real friends are, right? My Hindu friends, my Muslim friends, my Christian friends, who had absolutely no need for a mansion on bench. You know, they all came in for, you know, 50 bucks, 100 bucks. And this is 10 years ago where, you know, that meant a lot more to us at the time. Uh, so we raised enough to make... Get the illustrator, print the books, make 500 mentions, and then I had to go to my wife again and be like, "Hey, I kind of think we should make a thousand mentions." I need 10 grand. And that's exactly what I was like. Can I have 10 grand? And she's yeah. like, uh, "Okay." So we made all those mentions. Now they arrived, and I opened it up, and the books were like falling apart. They were absolute shit. And this is where like it was another key moment that I was like. I think we got to reprint these things and there's no time. We got to do it in the U S and a thousand of them. It was a thousand. Of them. So the mentions cost about at that point, uh, they're $14 each. Okay. Right. So it, it was about $10,000 to, to make those extra 500. And I was like, we need to remake these books overnight. Again, printed laminated hardcover. It was another seven grand. And that was calling in favors to friends. And, I was like, look, this is our name. We've I've literally reached out to every single person I've ever met. I don't want to put out crap. And we put another seven thousand dollars that had no return on investment. Like we were never gonna see anything. Eating up back. what you thought the margin was going to be. Yeah. And we did it. Uh we sent them all out. It went, you know, great. Uh, I could tell a story of how we got the PR and we were on the view and the today show and yeah talk about that i mean we'll go i'm not on it we'll keep going as long as when you walk out that's when we'll stop all right okay so the so tell talk that about that story because i think what i know about entrepreneurs usually you don't make it in this room without continuing the journey not really many people who quit have made it in here and so there's these key things you just mentioned one of them when the books came in and they fell apart neil there are so many people that we haven't met that quit then Right. Right. This is this journey of entrepreneurship and those moments never stop. Or you could ship it with bad product and then it dies. The Correct. People are like, oh, this was Neil's crappy product. It's these critical decisions. So, so yeah, talk about the PR and how this thing gets kicking. So, so you had a thousand of these things to sell. Were those pre-sold? So I pre-sold 300 okay. through Kickstarter. So I had 700 left to sell. Uh, and at 14 bucks each, you know, you get the idea that's like, oh, 4,200 bucks. I think it's more. Is that so how much were they? 14 bucks each. Oh, wow. Okay. So 14 times 300. No, that's... No, 14 times 700. I had oh, 700 that's good. Left. So you're $9,800. Yeah. So plus now I'd invested seven grand in the books. So now I... You got 700. You better sell these. Now I got no job and I'm, you know, 20 grand in a hole. Uh, With inventory sitting in your garage. Yeah. So, and I would joke to my wife. I'm like, we got more Jews in this house than they were in Cincinnati. She's like, I did not sign up for no, this she, shit. No, she isn't. <laughs> so... This is where it's like the grind. So when I did Kickstarter, I literally went through my LinkedIn profile and emailed personally, like cut and paste, but I wrote individual sentences to every single person on LinkedIn. Then I did it to every single person on Facebook, every single person on my email. And when I ran out of people to talk to, I went to random Jews on Twitter. I went to friends of friends on Facebook. I mean, I, I was a pain in the ass. 
So we, I grinded my way to the $22,000, we successful Kickstarter. Then I did the same thing with PR. So I started reaching out to local news, uh, papers, stations all around the country, trying to get them to talk about Mench on a Bench. And I end up reaching out to this guy. My hometown is Marblehead, Massachusetts. And there's this guy there. He runs a page called All Marblehead on Facebook. He's a realtor. So he posts. I can appreciate that. Yeah. Most of the time he is posting houses. But in between, he posts some like human interest stuff. So I in this uh, message. It's like, hey, I'm from Marblehead originally. I just put out this new product. I'd really appreciate if you put it up there. My mom would be so proud to see it on your page. This guy takes that exact message with the my mom would be so proud and puts it on his page with my link. And I'm totally embarrassed, but he does it. Somebody from my hometown worked at CBS News, read that article, wrote a small blurb for CBS Boston locally that picked up some of my funny key terms, putting more funica to Hanukkah, the, you know, best Jewish tradition, newest Jewish tradition since the Old Testament. You know, I had elf envy. Like, I have all these, like, little jokes that people kind of laugh at the first time. You know, for me, they're not funny. And there's enough Jewish people in the media that helped you, too. They did. Well, it's a stereotype. Ah, In that case, it might be true. It's true. That's a Uh, positive thing. So that got shared hundreds and hundreds of times that morning. And by that afternoon, it was one of the other local stations in Boston ran a TV spot on it. And by next morning, the Huffington Post had picked it up and then Salon. And then during that, I'd air shipped. So it cost $30 each to air ship these in a dozen pieces. And I had them. I sent it to The View, to The Today Show, to ABC, as well as a couple smaller outlets I had a better chance at. And by the time the Today Show called me and said, hey, we'd love to carry this, I was like, you already have one in your mailroom. And that's how we got on the Today Show and The View, and it blew up. So we sold out of those 700 I had at 36 bucks each in uh, a few days. And then I went to pre-orders. So you to spend- So you got all your money back. So that's another 25K. Got all my money back. Yep. And then I got over 1,000 orders pre-orders for next year so it was like hey i'm not going to fill this for another six to nine months but you can get yours now um another thousand people so then i got by the time it was all done i had revenue of almost a hundred grand um and with that that was enough for me to apply to shark tank and all that press was enough to get me into target walmart bed bath and beyond michael's so by the time I went on to Shark Tank, I had $750,000 in purchase orders for the next year. And at that point, this is where I had to go back to my wife again and be like, look, they need a deposit for the mentions. We got to mortgage the house. And I was like, I need some money. She's like, how much? And I was like, all of it. And she's like, what do you mean? I was like, we, did, we just bought this new house so we could barely afford when we moved here. So I was like, I need all the 401ks, yep. all the kids' college money. And I was like, look. Here's the deal. If you give me a hundred grand, I'll have two hundred thousand dollars back to you in ninety days. It is almost risk free, unless a boat sinks. Yes. And my wife was like, "Insure the boat." Yeah, <laughs> you can. <laughs> I know. Uh, so your wife was like, well, "I was like, all right, I'm in." So I ended up sending a hundred grand to a factory I'd never, you know, new factory. These guys got my cost from fourteen bucks to seven bucks. I was going to ask that you could leverage the volume once you had those pre-orders, yeah. uh, and it all worked out. And then by the time I went on to Shark Tank, um, you know, what they don't show is the first half hour, I got killed. So I walk out there, they're not supposed to interrupt your pitch. And you, you're supposed to get 90 seconds. They, they're One rule of Shark Tank is let them have their 90 seconds, then you can jump on them. I didn't even make it through my 90 seconds. Was it Cuban that crushed you? Or you said I wanted to see the packaging? It was Cuban and then Barbara. And I think it was Barbara... Right when I finished, Barbara goes, is this offensive? And Mark goes, of course this is offensive. Look at this. And I had practiced, practiced, practiced. Like, I knew my talking points. I'd read all their books. I had all my numbers. I'd never gone through a scenario in which they said, is this offensive? So right off the bat, like, I'm on my back heels. And then they, Cuban's like, what do you need the money for? And I was like, I want to make an animated special because... I want Mench to be an evergreen brand, and that's how you do it. And every single shark looked at me and said, nope. 
you are a toy guy, you do really well at toys. If you want to talk about us investing in toys, we'll do that, but not in entertainment. I was like, great, let's talk toys, right? Because you got to pivot. And then Cuban turns to me again. He's like, so what do you need the money for? And I'm like, I don't know. I, now I'm on my toes because the answer was entertainment, but now I don't have a backup answer. So now I'm like, uh, well, maybe we'll do an app. He's like, an app? What a terrible idea. And I'm like, it might be. I haven't really thought about it. Like, I'm trying to do this on my toes. And I was sweating, like full on. You're like, this is my shot and it is blowing up. Yeah, panic attack. I literally was thinking about Turn around, walking out. Where's the exit? They stopped production to give me a handkerchief to wipe my head. It was that bad. And I was like, this is not going how I want to. They're, the questions are all random. So Bar I think Laurie asked me a question. She's like, what, what retailers are you in again? And I was like, Laurie, do you mind if I just take a step back and tell you how I came up with this idea, how I launched it, and then tell you how many retailers I'm in and kind of give you an idea of the flow and I got my feet back under me, told my story. And once I got out the words that I'd been at Hasbro, that changed the whole conversation. Because I went from a joke, right? You're like, I'm this little funny Jewish guy. I'm like singing and dancing on stage. And it's like a Jewish toy company. Like, who wants that? To, oh, maybe this is a market. It's a toy guy. He's got almost a million dollars in sales. Uh, and that changed everything. Then it went really positive, and then they were bidding against each other. So your first ask, you came out and said, I'm looking for $150,000 for 10% of my company. Yeah. Right? Or 15%. No, 10%. 10%. And then you end up selling. So Who knows what? Yeah, talk about this, how this goes down. So I did all the math, and I was like, look, I think at very least I'm going to do like a million dollars in sales this year, because I had 750 in purchase orders already. And I was like, if I take my multiple of even being – you know, conservative, let's say 2X, my company's worth a couple million dollars. So You valued it at 1.5. I'm a value at 1.5 because I don't want to get laughed off stage and I want a bidding war, so I'm purposely going in below where I think it is. And in my mind, I was, I was like, they're going to see that that's a good deal because multiples make sense and whatever. And then they said, okay, instead of 10%, we'll give you 150 grand for 30%, which values it at about $500,000. And you're like, wait a minute. You're valuing a company at five hundred grand. That's I already have seven hundred fifty thousand in orders. Yeah, that the multiple like doesn't make any sense, and the value you're adding isn't necessarily consummate with that. So, I had this backup plan, and my wife and I had talked about this. I was like, "Look, if shit goes awry, here's plans A, B, and C." Right? And one plan was I had Damon John's cell phone number. He wasn't there that day. I was going to call Damon John on the phone because if nothing else, I was going to get on TV. Right? Another plan was I will guarantee their payback and I'll put my house up as collateral. You'll That's find, a different angle. You'll find that this is a common theme with me. I put my house up as collateral like four or five times now. Uh, and that's what I ended up doing. And I said, look, the 30% isn't reasonable. I can go to 15 and I'll guarantee that you'll get paid back. And I knew like with $750,000 in orders, I was going to be profitable a couple hundred grand. I could take their money, put it in a bank account, never touch it, and pay them back over the next three years, and then I'd still have been on Shark Tank, and you know all those doors are going to open. And that's what I ended up doing, and it's the best decision I ever made. How long did it take for – so you made the deal with Lori. Lori and Robert. Okay, both of them. Yeah. Um, two of what I, – I don't care. I'll, two of it seems to be the most reasonable um, and pleasant people there. They are. Right. They are. Uh, I will tell you, especially Laurie. So Robert, you know, is a tougher business personality behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Still very nice guy, very kind family guy um, and prioritizes. Right. So he spends a lot more time with tipsy elves than he does with Match on a Bench because tipsy elves mm -hmm. does, you know, a multiple of 100 times what we do. So that makes sense. He spends 100 times more time with them. Lori is just such a sweet person, and I filmed a follow-up show with her. Um, I saw that where you went to Bed Bath and Beyond. Yeah, yeah, and that was my anniversary. And I said something in passing. Was like, I can't believe I'm spending my anniversary like this. She's like, It's your anniversary, and she had her husband go make reservations, and she took me and my wife out for uh, dinner that night. And when my son got bar mitzvahed, 
she wrote him a note, said to the boy who inspired Mitch on a bench. And there were two significant checks in there. One that said, this is for fun. And one said, this is for college. And like, she absolutely did not need to do that. Um, and that is, she's just a classy person. And to his lover forever. Yeah, I mean, I'm totally loyal to her, yep. and I know she didn't do that, so I would tell the story. But, like, I'm going to tell the story because I think she's great. Uh, Which one of those comes, is it a chicken or an egg thing? Because she's obviously highly intelligent, or else she wouldn't be where she is. She may be really nice, which you say she is, but I guarantee those are intentional strategic moves, too. She, So she's part of a true team. Her and her husband are really a team and she is the face and he's the behind the scenes and they do a good job of kind of doing good cop, bad cop. She, at least when I've been with her, she's never been bad cop. The husband has been bad cop, you know, a few times. Um, and I feel like whether that's her personality or what they've worked out, you know, that has worked out when I've been with Robert, you know, he could be good cop or bad cop, depending on the day you catch him on. And my relationship with them has built over the past decade of, for the first few years, it was just proving I was capable, right? So I'm not going to take a lot of your time. I'm doing nice quarterly write-ups to say, this is what's going on with the business. This is how much we're making. This is how much you're making. This is the help I need, which typically is not a lot. And I try to keep it to one ask per year of, hey, Larry, could you put this on social media? Or, hey, Robert, the Bed Bath & Beyond buyer, and this really happened, at some point stopped responding to my messages. Don't know why. And they were a huge account for us. And I had Robert send an email to them instead of coming for me. And it's like, okay, that got a response. And that's how I try to use them. Or Robert and I threw out the first pitch at Fenway Park together. Um, so those are the kind of things I don't call them on a day-to-day -day basis to be like, hey, I got an idea for a Jewish zebra. It's the zebra from Zion. You know, they they don't care. You know, what um, What do you think their net worth is a piece? There's a reason for me asking the question. Well, he is. His is probably north of $100 million. I don't know. It's He's not a billionaire. I don't. He's probably close. I know he sold some of the Hershevec group to private equity. So he's uh, it's hundreds of millions hundreds of dollars of millions. at least. Yeah. What about Lori and her husband? I I couldn't even guess. I, I would. Throw a number out there. Throw it high in case you're so you don't piss him off. Uh I mean, seventy-five million. Okay, so let's just say a hundred million. Yeah, hundred. All right. Million. So you're sitting and dealing with two very so success leaves footprints and receipts. So very successful business people, and I'm sure there's people out there that hate them that didn't have a good interaction, whatever. But two very successful people. What did you find when you try to give them? You don't ask much from them, and you try to engage with them as little as possible. Give them the information they need. What do you think for them is the most important thing, being an investor in you? What's the most important thing to get? Is it like, is it that you just do what you say? Yeah, like, I think it's competence, right? Yeah. It's just, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make this. I'm going to ship it. Like, all of my stuff for 10 years has always shipped on time, on cost. We've always been profitable, except for one year with COVID where, you know, everything. It was a shit show. Yeah, it was a shit show. Um but beyond that, it's like I've said I'm going to do it. I do it. I'm respectful to them. Every time I talk about them in the media, I'm honest and I say positive things about them. And they've each called me on different occasions. And Robert was like, hey, I'm looking at buying into uh, this other company on Shark Tank. I might want you to come in and run it. What do you think of that? And we ended up not pursuing it, but it was like what a privilege that in his sphere of like people I would trust to run something – and we actually had a conversation about me going to work for the Hirschvet Group as their uh, ombudsman between his Shark Tank investments and his team to try and help uh, steer things. And it ended up, you know, again, wasn't the right fit at the right time. But the fact that they called and said, hey, we're considering you for this, um, you know, that's how it starts. You're like, yeah, I'm out there as a joke. I'm the Jewish toy guy. But like, hey, I'm just playing a clown on tv i'm actually kind of strategic and you know have some ideas and so what's your takeaway we always talk about these next generations but i don't think it's just the next generations it's people our age it's people a little older they want it now you earned that over a decade with these folks yeah I, like they want it now you don't get it now no no i mean listen relationships are long term right and there's give and take and you know i wanted them to fall in love with me from day one 
and you know they liked me but yeah you have to earn things with people and uh you know i i don't necessarily find that with the new generation like my it's uh, all of us yeah my new company i bought uh the guy i bought from was 30 years old you know it feels funny to be you know i'm in my mid 40s to go and hand this guy who is 30 you know a few million dollars to be like i want what you built because i couldn't do it myself uh it's kind of humbling uh how do you know to give him a few million dollars how do you know it's right we just talked about hershevec and the companies they invest in because yeah how do you know because i don't want to weed the question yeah uh how do, you, how do you know to give the give whatever person three million i mean that is not so i think part of what i've learned is know what you're good at right I'm good at marketing. I'm good at ideas. I'm good at partnerships. I'm not great at finances. I'm okay. You know, I got my MBA. I can. So I called up a bunch of friends and we went through these financials together and built models and make sure it was sound. But from like a strategic standpoint, I looked at his company and said, his bones are totally solid. And in order for me to build what this guy has done would probably take five to 10 years. He has distribution in every single comic and gaming store. Uh, he has great products. He has relationships. He, he does not have any real marketing. He doesn't have any licensing. He doesn't have uh, really polished packaging, all the stuff that I'm good at. So I did the analysis of, okay, if that's the foundation of the house, I could build on top of this. And I think I could make a really significant impact. Um, and I'm willing to bet on myself to do that. And that significant in impact means significant ROI. Yeah, and listen, we valued his company based on what he was doing today, not based on what I was doing. Um, it's private equity. Yeah. That's oh. what private equity does. That's what Hershevec does. It's what Shark Tank does. It's the same thing. Yeah, and the difference is, like, I'm putting my heart and soul into it, and I think it makes a difference. So when I call up these other gamers and, you know, I'm working with a couple of the biggest podcasts out there, right? They are doing live play Dungeons and Dragons. They're guys who go online and play and people will literally fill stadiums like to watch these guys play live. Um, and I call them. I'm like, I love this. I love what you're doing. I want to help you. I don't want to do a label slap. And there's this podcast called not another D and D podcast. The dude has an armadillo is like his character, right? It has an armadillo. He has I, a live armadillo. No, no, on, on his for his icon. For, for his icon yeah. is, is an armadillo for dungeon. I went and put armadillos inside of dice and made these really unique sets that nobody had ever done before. And it's like that's the kind of thinking and appreciation they dig it, and it sold really well. And when you talk about wanting it now versus building, you know, now it's been a year and a half of bringing them ideas like this that nobody else is bringing them and delivering. Right. So this is three or four times that these guys who didn't know me had to write very large checks to me and say, I hope this guy's going to bring me 5000 armadillo dice. You know, mm -hmm. he might not. Um, and once we've done that, now I'm able to go to them and be like, hey, I got this other idea. What about this armadillo bag? What about if I made you a stuffed armadillo? And this is something like for the dice company had never done plush. Well, I have made you know, to hang in our mirrors. In the car? I've thought about that. <laughs> Doing multi-sided dice. 20-sided <laughs> die that hang from the mirror. I've thought about that. All right, sorry. I got you off track. Um, so plush dice. So, but think about beyond dice. So now I'm doing armadillos. plush armadillos, plush dice bags that look like dragons. That Are you hanging out with Gary Vaynerchuk a lot? Oh, I love him. Right? Because he's got that with the V friends, and he created all those. Yeah. Right? And now he's pu pushing that stuff yeah, hard. Yeah, I love his hustle. Yeah. Um, I really like everything about that guy. Everything? Yeah, so far. Okay. I mean, I really I really appreciate the hustle and the grind he has, too. Uh, yeah, I, I've right. listened to a bunch of his podcasts and his books. And you know what like he does? He just does it. See, that's the thing. Everybody else talks about it. Everybody else has these ideas. What he does, it's really damn simple. It's, it's really simple. I'm not saying it's not hard to execute, but it's just simple. He, he started think he acts yeah yeah well i think it's the thoughts that all of us have it's you do good a good job of it you have a thought and you execute on it right. that's all he does and he's authentic oh that's what i like about him is he'll drop f-bombs on stage and he don't care i feel like the gary that you see on camera yeah. is the gary that you're getting off camera now i don't know if that's true but i feel that way 
And that's what really makes me a fan. So here comes the authenticity thing again. Yeah. So that matters to you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Huh. The um, So this company, isn't it funny that I, I guess the passion that you have for gaming somewhat as a 44-year-old guy, you show up and there's 16-year-old kids and 18-year-old kids and 20. And, but the passion you have probably make, made you relevant when you started talking dice with the Dungeons & Dragons. Yeah. Guy, right. So, first of all, there are two types of people in the world, right? Those who know what a D20 is and those who don't. I don't. All right. See? So I'm so, that guy. So you're that guy, right? So if I said, hey, I got a D20, I automatically know you're never going to be you know, somebody I want to talk to. D20 is a 20-sided die. You don't want to talk to me? Well, he no, never wants to talk to me, guys. Yeah, no, I'm leaving. Uh, <laughs> about so, your business. About my business. Yes. If you're a D20 guy, like, if you at least know what it is, yep. it means you've been in this world enough to see it, and you know at least the most basic entry term is a 20-sided die is the most important die that you use. Um, and I am I was at least in that group, right? I'd play Dungeons & Dragons as a teenager, I collect comic books. I'm in the gaming store every week. So the fact that I don't know that when you roll a fireball spell, you need D6s, like, I can learn that. Now, since I didn't know D20s, now I went to fireballs and D6s. Now do the kids bring the fireball shots with that, too, or what goes? That's for adults. <laughs> oh, they somebody did. Uh, who was it? Matt Lillard just launched Dungeons & Dragons whiskey last week. There you go. I mean, it's wild, isn't it? The ideas are everywhere. Um, what do you think? Is there something important about that, that not wasting your time? We're talking about it today, so thanks for coming on talking about D20s. But that you need to know who your audience is. Like, yeah. Is that, we're trying, I, real, I think so. I yeah. mean, for both. Like, you know, I like bringing joy to people's house. That is like my common theme, whether it's with games or gaming or Jewish products, or I used to work on G.I. Joe. I love the fact that I'm having a positive impact on somebody's house. And the G.I. Joe fans were the same way. Like, mm -hmm. if they would come up and be like, you painted his feet are the same color as the 1984 stalker figure. And you're like, I did do that. You noticed that? They're like, oh, thank you. And, like, that one guy who got that you put the attention in made the whole thing worth it. And it's the same thing. These Jewish families come up to me, and they're like, so thankful. And uh, last, we launched our new item this week. So I know we we're going to talk about what's off. Yes. Yeah. Uh, our new item is Judah Maccabee. So Judah Maccabee is the warrior who led the Jewish uh, rebellion during the story of Hanukkah. And I made a limited edition this year. This is before all the Israel happened. Uh, it was already coming out. And I had to, I, I had to launch the product, right? I have 500 of these, you know, sing around and it, with everything going on with the, israel palestinian situation was like how do we do that and how do we do it sensitively so i put this out last week and said now is a time that there's a lot of darkness in jewish homes and my job is to try and bring some light and some lightheartedness and here is a jewish hero that you can aspire to and your kids can aspire to and we're going to take 18 percent because 18 is lucky in judaism and donate it back to the paramedics who are working in israel and you know again we're you could be pro-Israel and not pro-war, right? And it's like we're donating to the paramedics because we want people to be saved. Uh, and the number of nice messages I got of thank you and what you're doing for my house and for my kids. And, like, my mom is proud of it. Like, it's so worth it. And I love that part of it. Do you, are, are we in different times where you had to be really careful not to appear opportunistic? Yeah. It's... This is a tough one, right? Because you definitely don't want to be opportunistic. Um, and there were a couple people that did, you know, there are always a couple people. So, um, and that's why I was like, look, this was the plan before this happened. Mm -hmm. We're donating to Israel. Hanukkah and Jewish kids are still going to be here this year. And our job is to make their life a little better. So if you want us to just stop talking, we could do that. Or we can keep doing what we're doing and try and make a positive impact in the world. Thank you very much. The art of communication and PR. Yeah. It, right. I mean, yeah, it's real. It goes back to authenticity, right? Like, if somebody wants to interview me, like, listen, 500 Judah Maccabee dolls. Uh, 
are not going to make a significant difference in my life, right? It's That's not the difference of whether my kids can go to college or not. I'm not being opportunistic and trying to make a quick buck, right? Like these are probably going to sell out anyways. Um, and if they didn't, I could just keep them in my garage. Like it's not a big deal. So when you explain that to people and a lot of times they're like, this big corporation is trying to take advantage. You're like, this big corporation is one dude who's got a pinball machine in his office and lives in Ohio. Uh, they're like, oh, really? Yeah. And my kid is named... Yeah, I uh, put yeah. it out there. My kid's Jacob Maccabee Hoffman. Yeah. I named him Jacob Maccabee Hoffman. Maccabee, Judah Maccabee and Maccabee. I named him that before I had the idea for Mensch, right? Like, I wanted a name that was inspirational and Jewish warrior. And so, like, it's all real. It's not like my kid's not a prop, right? I named my kid after the Jewish hero and then created a company around the Jewish hero, not the other way around. But the move that you, when you originally created it, you weren't planning on donating 18%. To no. the paramedic. See, that's important no, too about, about knowing the time you're in. It's right. like I have to do this now. Yeah. That's a business decision. Yeah, no, it is. It, right. It it felt like the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think people appreciated it. And 100%. again, you don't want to look opportunistic. Yep. And you see, you know, there's so much negativity around anti Semitism. Like it we do want to put this out and do some positivity in the Jewish world, but at the same time can't ignore what's going on in the world so yeah. it's like we can either lean into that and say we're going to take portion and donate and i did have one woman say only 18 percent and i was like what do you want me to do i'm sorry guys i mean i'm not sitting here this isn't pro bono i actually am running a business i have to make a profit i actually said any additional donations you would like to make here's the link there you go because that's the con that's a comedian in you yeah you it's awesome you could tell me how to run my company but yeah. like i I'll tell you how to spend a year. Would you like to buy one or not, ma'am? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, why do you think, why do you think the world is just anti? So how you brought up anti-Semitic. So why do you, cause I think the world's like anti anything than them. Something's driving that now. Yeah. I think part of the problem is social media that just because you have a voice doesn't mean it should be heard. Right. And now everybody feels like they have to document every moment of their life You're anti free speech neil you could say it i just don't have to listen to it uh you know take twitter like i don't need 12 x, x. take take x <laughs> i don't need you know 12 check-ins with somebody a day to know what they're thinking about every single element now there are thought leaders who have put lost thought and understand the background, and that's what I want to understand. A Ben Shapiro or something, whether people whether people like him or not, I don't understand what side of even the politics of Israel and being a Jew he is. I just know he's a thought leader. Yeah. Right? And he does his research. Like, I don't necessarily agree with everything he says, but the dude is well-researched, well-spoken, and... He, invite, uh, he invites a counter. Yeah. And he likes the counter. Like You that's, better be a good debater. I, I would rather hear that yeah. than somebody who just popped a thought into their head and said why don't we just send all the palestinians to egypt yep i don't know have you do you know anything about the history of palestinians or egypt no no, no they it's don't. it's like okay then do you know where they would live do you know how they would live nope, nope. it's like okay why'd you say that oh I, to your point just because you have an opinion doesn't need mean, means it needs to be heard right. right so i think that's where you get anti anything oh, anything right it's it doesn't matter what somebody is saying there's always somebody that says this is stupid it just doesn't make it here it just doesn't make sense to me this anti thing makes no sense to how my brain operates because i'm like when i spend so much time being anti everything else i'm really not spending enough time being pro me yeah i i get sucked into that in our small town there's small town politics and i've like gotten sucked into like their facebook page where i'm like debating with people and uh, a couple of years ago when i bought this company i left I was like, this is not adding value to my life. I'm not changing anybody's mind. I'm going to focus my time on doing better. Now, to be fair, with the election coming up, there's a school board election I'm involved in. So I jumped back in, and now I'm wasting my time getting in fights with people who I'm not going to change their mind. They're not, they're not going to change Do you think mind. this is a necessary part of, and we're going to go everywhere, is this a necessary part of a strong democracy? Is it? Is all this debate... And all, I hate the vitriol. That's the thing I yeah. hate, right? Because there, I guess there's not enough confident people just making arguments for their side. And that's what I would say about Shapiro. He's confident. 
He's done his research. It's not that he's a Harvard grad. There's idiots that come from Harvard. But he's done his research, and he puts it out there. And if you're good enough to debate him and put him in check, most likely he's not going to yell at you. He'll get passionate. Yeah. But he's not going to yell at you. But he has he has things behind what he's saying, and I'm not as conservative as that guy is. I'm not, right? So is it a central part of a democracy? I think it is, but I think nuance is lost. And here's what is lost in all discussions. I, I won't even go to my personal politics. But let's take some of the hot buttons, you know, whether it be immigration or gun control or abortion. abortion yep. They're all nuanced issues, right? They're not black and white. So – you know, you take abortion, and it's like, is it preconception all the way to birth? And that is a spectrum, and you fall somewhere on the spectrum of where you feel comfortable allowing that to happen. And if you say, yeah, I'm here on the spectrum, and it's complicated, I understand somebody might be here on the spectrum, how are we going to work this out? That's a discussion, but what ends up happening is people are so worried about this slippery slope, they go to the extremes on both ends, and they're like, absolutely you know every woman should have the right and nope we should have abstinence and it's like hmm maybe the truth is somewhere you know, in the middle is nuanced right, right? that's and, what nuance is yeah. it's like it's a sliding scale all the time and the funny thing is just that opinion and just me engaging with it the crazies on the right and the left lose their minds oh for sure lose their minds and then those are the ones that are really loud that a lot of times direct what happens because we're busy living our lives. Right. And I get sucked into that because I'll see some of the stuff about banning books. And for me, it, it brings up images of Hitler and yeah. anti-Semitism. So that's where, like, you know, my grandfather fled the Holocaust. And, like, I feel obligated to get involved. Um, and yeah. I know I'm better off running my business and staying out of it. But, you know, there was something recently where, you know, the Moms of Liberty – used a Hitler quote in one of their newsletters. And, and it's, it's like, come on, guys. Uh, it's a, there's a difference here. And there were people defending it, and I, like, yeah. you know. You just don't gain. The thing that sucks is you don't gain anything by going there. No. It, you might think, it, that, think that you're, you know, driving your flag in on some core principles that you think the world should have, but you just can't win. Right. No, I, I know. It I, sucks. I find myself fighting fights sometimes that, I shouldn't, yeah. and I'm better off. You know, I remind myself, like, hey, this person's posting in an echo chamber on Facebook. I run this company, right? And I can do more with Mensch. I can impact hundreds of thousands of Jewish families and make a positive difference, and that's where I should spend my time rather than the the 20 minutes it takes me to write a response to why you shouldn't use a Hitler quote. To, to like, 10 people. To, yeah, no, it was to one woman. But there's like nine people she affects. Yeah. And, or I can write my newsletter to go out to the Mention on the Bench crew. And hit 20 or 30 and, or 40,000. Exactly. And have a much larger audience and impact people who are willing to listen to a message. Um, More pro us and less anti yeah. them. And I'm not smart enough. Like, I'm staying out of, you know, the specifics of when I talk about thought leaders, right? Yeah. I'm not a thought leader on Israel, right? Mm -hmm. I'm a thought leader on interfaith marriages and how to celebrate and how to keep Judaism going. That's where, you know, I've spent 10 years thinking about this. If you want an intelligent discussion with somebody, I'd love to have that. There's a whole bunch of areas where I'm not intelligent. And I don't want to have that conversation. So here's, so I grew up, um, I guess you would call it Christian, but it was old Testament based. Everybody mm -hmm. thought I was Jewish. We, we ate kosher. Oh, wow. Celebrated the Sabbath from Friday night to Saturday because it was a true seventh day, not Sunday. Yeah. Didn't celebrate any of the pagan holidays. No Christmas, no birthdays. Wow. How about that stuff, huh? That is interesting. Yeah, but it was a church of God. Huh. Well, wow. if you want to switch teams, come on over. <laughs> Here's the funny thing. I don't see th – this could be good I go here or bad. I'm not on a team anymore. Here's what I can't figure out. You can talk about the interfaith stuff. That set me off because there was some doctrine that came out of – man, there was like – Hundreds of thousands of people that were in this church. It was cult. It was next level, just not good shit. They made people, they came out with this doctrine in like the 70s or 80s. They made people get divorced that had previously been married. Goes against some stuff and some doctrine stuff. And you definitely couldn't be married to someone else of another religion or a faith. This, here's why I'm not, I'm, I don't pick a team because I have one Muslim friend. He's an awesome guy. 
Um, I hope to have a Jewish friend, but there's people who are Jewish that work at the company I run. There's Christians. There's people who are, I don't know if they're agnostic, atheist, whatever that is. There's people that follow more Buddha. And here's what's tough for me to realize in this whole cosmic world that we're in. If there is one way, whatever the way, I don't know what it is because it's faith. If there's one way, it means everyone else is wrong. And everyone thinks that. Yeah. For me, it is less about that and the one way forward and more about what's cool about Judaism is you can follow the bloodline all the way back 5,784 years, right? So we know who our ancestors are, and it's like a tribe. It's a community that has been passing down these traditions. So for me personally, it's less about God and more about the community and who I surround myself with, and these traditions have been going on for so many years. Um, And that's why, you know, Mensch is so important to me because I want to pass down these traditions, not water them down. And I heard a rabbi give a sermon years ago, and in the Jewish community, they've cried for years that like interfaith marriages are going to be the death of Judaism, right? Eventually you're going to water it down. It's going to go away. But this rabbi said, look, let's take a moment and look at the other side. We used to have to live in the ghettos and we could only marry each other, right? We didn't have a choice. And now they're marrying us because they love us. They've accepted us. We are in American society. We have fully integrated in a way that we've never done before. And this doesn't necessarily it's not negative, right? It's in the past, we've always been persecuted and this is the opposite of this. They, they don't care. Yeah. They're just like, so yeah. is it right that there's 15 million Jews worldwide and like 6 million here in the yeah. U S yep. it seems like, so there's 7 billion people on the earth. There's 15 million people that, so what or 15 million? Is it, here's what's tough for me. Is it, is the cultural piece the most important piece? Is the religious piece the most most important piece? Like, what is it? It, you know, everybody's got their own answer. Like, I can okay. I can only answer for me. You yeah. know, I for me, it's culture, right? It's not the religious. It's not about God. It's it's about the tradition and what's happened for you know five thousand years. And I am a link in that chain, and I don't want to break that chain. And like for me, that's what's important. Um, for other people, you know. I don't know. It's some other thing, right? Yeah. The um, How did that, because you grew up in Massachusetts. Was yeah. this a suburb of Boston? Yeah. Okay. A lot of times when someone says a city in Massachusetts, I'm like, oh, it's a suburb of Boston. Yeah. Um, how did that impact you? Did you come to Cincinnati in 2012? When was it? So I came to Cincinnati uh, in 1999 for mm-hmm. three or four years, and then we moved back uh, in 2012. Okay. So I grew up uh, in a area that was 40 percent jewish uh i went to hebrew school hebrew high school hebrew jewish summer camp um so and you're a positive part of society how'd that happen yeah so we're not that bad folks (laughs) uh and then you know met my wife and we hit it off and uh, you know uh so for me it's trying to build my own jewish community out here that i if I was at home, I would probably go to the same rabbi I grew up with and, you know, have a different community. So there's a big community in Cincinnati, though. Yeah. And it's been really cool for me. I started off like I tried three or four different temples. And then in the past couple of years, I'm the president of our temple. I'm totally involved. And like, this is more Jewish than I ever thought I would be. So running. I'm definitely talking to the right Jew today then. Yeah, like, you know, this is not what my wife signed up for at the beginning, where I was like, oh, no, we're just going to do Hanukkah, and I don't like Christmas trees. Uh, and now I'm the president. And now I'm the president of the temple, and uh, we're going to Israel for, or we're you were. hoping to go to Israel for my son's bar mitzvah, uh, and I run a Jewish toy company, and it's like, this isn't really where I thought my life would go, and especially when I married somebody who's Catholic, um, but you follow your passions and you know, I'm, I love toys. I love being Jewish. I love making people happy. So you're just like you know. a big smiling, happy kid. Yeah. Right. That's all I want. I yeah. like kids and dogs and you have kids. Yeah. Do they like their kid dad? Uh, until they're about 13, they like their kid dad. Uh, there's a line at which I'm not allowed to embarrass my 15 year old anymore. And that's, Uh, you've crossed it. We've crossed that. So it's just like, dad, don't talk to my girlfriend. Just behave yourself. Keep keep it reined in. 
And like with my little guy, he's like, oh, do the voice, do the voice, you know. Antagonizing the 15 year old yeah. situation. So, uh, you know, when's it going to come back that he's like, hey, dad, I really appreciate you for who you were. Is that like 1924? No, I think when he has kids. Okay. And then I can be the character again. Uh, because I love that my house is where all the kids come to and play, and I like mix it up with them. And, you know, does he actually tell you to behave? Oh, yeah. Oh, What's yeah. that mean when he tells you that? Because his behave might be different than your behavior. They're the same. No, I know. I know. I know what I'm doing it. So, like, for example, my 15 year old plays uh, soccer, and they were looking for an announcer for the soccer team. And I was like, oh, I'll do it. And I was like, every kid that comes out, I'll give them a special name. And I'll be like, and here comes Jacob Lightning Hoffman. And he's like, absolutely not. You can't do that. Nope. And I know if I'm out, if I'm in front of that microphone, I can't help myself. So he banned me. My little guy was like, when I get to high school, you can do it. And I was like, you promise? So... I keep reminding him, and he's like, oh, do the announcing. You know, when he plays soccer, I yell funny things to him all the time. I'll be like, hey, are your shoulders tired? Because you're carrying this whole team on your back. <laughs> or, hey, somebody get an ambulance. He just broke that kid's ankles. Sometimes and, do you get the kind of like shake off look over from him? Eh, sometimes. I mean, I say some weird stuff sometimes. I told him to eat some kid like a taco one time, and he was like, hmm. he looked at me and just shrugged. Could you but, come up with like a jewish metaphor maybe instead oh i gotta think about it let me work on that for the next game <laughs> um what do you think uh your entrepreneurial journey what um what did you take all the things you've learned all these lessons that you found really essential when acquiring the dice company like are there things mentally that you knew like i'm relying on that i'm relying on that i'm relying on that uh or yeah i now? i do i think there's you get to a point where you have no fear about being rejected, right? And it might be that somewhere where you're married for 20 years and you're like, oh, nobody can reject me anymore, right? Like, and I believe in the law of three no's, right? Like, you could tell me no, and that's just the beginning of our conversation. Um, and I've taken that to the Dice Company, and it's amazing. Some of our biggest clients are just people I looked up on LinkedIn and these podcasts we had no relationship with them. I just called them and said, Hey, I own a dice company. I really like what you guys are doing. Can we have a conversation? No. What if we do it in like a month? No. What about if I were to fly out to your show and come see you? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. All right. Now we're getting somewhere. Uh, and that happened with, you know, Dungeons and Dragons. I pitched them uh, the biggest, you know, they're, the biggest know, podcast in that space. Well, they own the game, right? Like yeah. the tabletop gaming space is a synonymous with Dungeons and Dragons. And I went to them and said, I'd love to make your dice. And they said, no, we just signed a new partner. We're not going to talk to anyone for six months. And I said, okay, um, see you soon. At six months, I called her on the day and said, hey, it's been six months. Uh, are you going to the show? I'd love to have a conversation. Well, yeah, maybe we could talk in a few months. And I just kept driving until I finally got an in-person conversation with her. And I had developed an entire line. I mean, it was done, final, gorgeous. And she gave me a half an hour. And by the end, she's like, I think we got something here. Um, How much preparation time did you put in in preparing for that meeting that you had been trying to get for months and months and months? I mean, that was we spent thousands of dollars on development in terms of uh, all the artwork and I had prototypes. It's like, look, if you get one swing, like I don't do that for everything, but that was, had you reverse engineered what the revenue could be? Is that why you went all in <coughs> like that? Yeah. I mean, or the influence and the impact, they're the 800 pound gorilla, you know? And I, I think if you can, I don't even think about revenue at this point. Like, yes, there's revenue, but if you're the dice company that's associated with Dungeons and Dragons, you can get any other partner you want. Might and be a loss leader. It won't be, uh, but but even be. if it were, you, you maybe you should debate doing that. So I worked two different strategies simultaneously. I went from the bottom up and then top down. So I collected anyone that will do anything with me, and my roster now has fifteen to twenty different companies that are making different games or doing different podcasts and each one kind of growing to bigger and bigger opportunities. At the same time, I was going for a top down saying, if I can get D 
D&D itself, then everybody else is going to say yes when I say, hey, I'm the D&D guy. Um, and now those two are kind of meeting in the middle. And as I look at it, the number of companies and partnerships we have, um, I think within two years of buying the company will have doubled the revenue. How, as I'm thinking about you doing this, I'm like, Neil can't do everything. You're the strategy, passion, vision, relationship guy. But you're not necessarily the finance, as you said, the accounting. You're not the behind the scenes guy, or are you? Uh, not always. So, again, it goes to knowing what you're good at. So I have a partner in the business who is my finance and inventory and HR guy, because those are all things I suck at. Uh, and then the guy I bought the business from, I kept him on. Three year, five year, whatever. Yeah. And I, actually, I put together this deal for him that said, look, I'll pay you a full-time salary. I need you to work part-time. So you work three hours a day. I'll pay you like you're full-time. And he can do in three hours what a normal person could do in eight. And what it would take me, you know, 20 or 30 hours a week to do. So he does all my communication with China. So I come up with an idea. And I'll give you an example. We, um, we make dice trays. So there are these square trays. And so you don't have to roll your dice on the table. They... You roll them right here. Yeah. So I came up with the idea of like, hey, sometimes it's dark. You can't see the the dice. Let's put lights in there. An LED lit tray. So we did LEDs. It sucked, right? The LEDs shone into your face. You couldn't see the dice. It was, But he, he did. He executed my idea. And I was like, okay, that idea sucked. What if we changed it to black lights? So then we went to black lights. That worked. And we did glow dice. And then I said, well, we have this really cool technology. It's liquid filled dice. Think of a snow globe that sh works like a die. What that if the black light shines up when you roll them. So it has like highlighter fluid inside. So when you roll it, it glows iridescent green. It's like nothing anybody's done before. Uh, so I'm good at the ideas and I know it can be done. I'm not saying, hey, build me a space elevator. It's like, no, put lights into a tray. Uh, but my partner is able to do that and take all the orders and bring everything in from China and allow me to, to develop execute relationships and sales and pitching and be the high energy guy. So what can we learn that you couldn't have gotten to the black light idea without the shitty LED? Yeah. Then you couldn't have got to the gotten to the point where there is antifreeze filled dice without the black lights. Yeah. What do we make of that? Uh, you know. Ideas have to build on each other, right? And it doesn't always start with a good idea. It's about ending with a good idea. And I used to have this saying to my boss. I was like, hey, man, I come up with a lot of ideas. And my problem is I have a little bit of a tough time telling the really good ones from the really bad ones. So that's where I need your help. And I was like, I, and as I've gotten older and it's 20 years difference, that's where I've refined that skill. And now it's like, I can't turn off the idea generation, right? There's always going to be like, hey, what if I did this? What if I did that? But now I'm smart enough myself to say, nope, that's a bad idea. That's a bad idea. Uh, and can filter things. Now, that doesn't mean it's foolproof, right? So I just made a stupid mistake, um, which is kind of funny. And, I'm, and I describe it as I'm too old to make mistakes like this. Um, those liquid-filled dice I put in a glass jar with a cork on top and it was uh, elixir dice was the brand name and it, ha it had an apothecary feel and my partner uh adam who does all the production is like hey i'm worried about the glass i'm like oh man people ship stuff in glass all the time it's fine it's like yeah i'm worried they're gonna break i was like all right you know what let's ship it from china to the u.s we'll pack them nicely like we're really gonna pack them and we'll see if they break so they come over every single one's whole not a problem so Adam's like, great, we order thousands of these things. Turns out the issue was not putting it on the boat and getting it here because a boat goes slowly up and down. It's the truck that you put them on and the truck goes a little bit side to side and they didn't shatter from the outside in, which is what we planned for. They shattered from the inside out as the dice were rolling around the glass. Uh, and I ended up with, you know, 20% of these things were broken and now I had to go find a solution of, okay, now we need plastic, and now I need to hire somebody to hand put everyone. Before the cork goes on. Inside the, to secure the dice from the glass or no? No, we, we just got rid of the glass altogether. altogether. That was one way to do it. We could have filled 
with like a sponge or something. Yeah. Uh, we ended up, you know, and my guys in the warehouse had cut fingers and whatnot from handling all the glass. Um, and I was like, that was one of my ideas. I was like, yes, glass apothecary bottles. That's brilliant. And it looked really cool. And then the execution totally failed. And somebody warned me and I wasn't smart enough to take that warning. And it's like, all right, I'm too old to make mistakes. Like was that, that blinders or was it arrogance that you just write too often? Uh, I'm not sure if I'm right too often, but, uh, but you said you have, you have a, maybe a microscope now to know more yeah, right from wrong. It might, uh, you know, confirmation had, bias. They talk about this in all parts yeah, of our lives. Bias. I'm not sure it was arrogance. Cause I acknowledged that I could be wrong and tested it. So I even said like, Hey, I'm not the smartest guy in the room. Let's make sure that this works. And then we did the test. But there was a factor I didn't think about. Is that just going to happen sometimes? I think and, that just, that's experience, yeah. right? And now, like, I see other companies shipping similar things, and I'm like, oh, should I tell them? You might yeah. get away with that, but most likely in the long term, it's going to get you. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, but I listen, you're always going to learn. If you're not learning, then you're not pushing the boundaries of what you can do. So That's the entire underpinning of entrepreneurship. You just don't know. I think... Um, we can't learn and grow without failure. I think the challenge is, is to be honest with yourself and be reflective once we do fail so I, we don't keep failing. And, and failing I think fail. fail small. You know, so I'm putting out probably 20 or 30 new items with the Dice Company this year, just constantly like, hey, what about this? What about this? Like the advent calendar being an example that, that I talked about earlier. Um, we're not betting the farm on anything. So there have been a number of times I've sold out and I've left a bunch of money on the table which sucks, but there have not been any instances where I've totally missed and I'm sitting on thousands of pieces of something that I don't know what to do with. So I'm taking slightly smaller swings and not being afraid to fail and saying, look, I know not everything's going to work. Let's just do enough to see what the good ideas are. And we're going to run this company for a while and we're going to. Do we get too scared because we don't want to lose what we get? I don't think so. I mean, I think if if you take big swings like that, it might be because you're desperate, right? And I think that's how you fail. You're not going to fail. Like, what I'm working on is, this is new for me. I've run toy businesses before, but this is still a new business. My goal is to grow and not shrink. And it's not to grow exponentially. And if you're trying to grow exponentially, you take big swings, and with big swings come big misses. But it's like, hey, man, if I hit... 10 singles in a row, I double this business. So you said earlier, I'm looking for a debate between us somewhere. You said earlier that you just say yes all the time. I do. Uh, I believe in expandable capacity. So I feel like I can almost always make enough time for the work. Any, any time someone reaches out to me and says, hey, I have a friend who would like to talk to you about X. I always say yes. And those, and it's selfish, right? Like, first of all, I like helping people. I like talking to people. I'm an extrovert. I'm selfish because that's a screening for me. Every single call is like Shark Tank, right? It's like, oh, what do you have? And sometimes those turn into really big deals or situations. Or a lot of times I can hook two people up with, you know, a phone call and make money on it. Um, you know, that happens to me all the time where I'll make a call and I'll be like, hey, if this works out, just build in a couple points for me. And they're like, sure. A couple points or a couple, that's a couple percent to most yeah. people. That's what that is. So, yeah. you know, and part of it is like, I don't do that too often. You know, probably 80% of the time I just make introductions just for funsies. And I'm like, hey, like yesterday a dude called me. He had a crazy, he had just bought a business that was fake teeth. Right. And for people who are missing teeth, you can mold them and put them in your mouth. And then as part of that, they had these funny teeth. Like you've seen those funny, weird, like make your teeth look gross on purpose. Is that uh, maybe that came out of costumes? And yeah, stuff it's originally. like costumes. And then I know a guy from Shark Tank who does sun stashes, who does all the sunglasses and make yourself look goofy. So I was like, oh, all right. I didn't think I'd have anything for the denture guy. But here, why don't you guys talk? And like, you know what? Both of those guys are going to remember that. And when there's a positive situation that you know, somehow involves dice. I just want to put together, you know, how do they, how do you there. know when to leverage it? The 20% of the time. Cause you're like, this is a home run. I'm there've been a, a couple that I've missed where I'm like, dang it. Uh, but yeah, you, you kind of get a gut feel for, 
is this something where it's a combination of how much of my time is this going to take and how big is this opportunity? The you brokerage know, business of New Hall. Yeah. I mean, there are plenty of times where it's like, oh, you know, I help this guy. He's going to make his board game. He's going to sell, you know, $20,000 a year. He could probably afford to give me, you know, 500 to a thousand dollars, but you know what? It's not even worth it asking for it. Yep. You know, it's let me like, get a percent or two. Cause if this hits, I'm going to love that. Yeah. I'd rather even just say like, Hey, I'm going to just help you yeah. for fun and put out a good vibe. And then when that dude does hit it big or sells to another game, he calls up is like, Hey, how can I help? I mean, that just happened. A guy who invented a new kind of yo-yo product. I ended up getting him a licensing deal with Yomega. Um, I didn't ask for anything. It was just two friends. It was literally an email. Didn't, and that guy just started a new company. Called me. And was like, "Hey, I got some idea for your dice stuff. You want to work together?" It was like it had been ten years, but he remembered that I was good to him and appreciated it. Um, so why hasn't all this failure stopped you? What those there's a there's many moments, right? You, in the beginning, you lost your job. You had the idea. You're creative. You go on Shark Tank. It shit's hitting the fan. You have these glasses, and that's not working. The books ship on the first thousand, and the books are no good, and you have to get them. There are people who take failure or take people shitting on them, and it pushes them down. And then there are people who say, fuck you. That's just giving me a reason to succeed. I'm in that second group. I need to be slighted by someone. I like being slighted by someone. Who? Where did that? Where did that like being? Is that a kid? Is that maybe being a Jew and having somewhat of a chip on yeah, your shoulder? What know. is it? I, I mean, I'm a five foot two Jew with a big mouth who's never been in a fight in his life. So it's like, uh, this I is how you're fighting. That's how I fight, right? So it's like, oh, you're gonna trash me? Great. I'm not gonna beat you with my fist. I'm gonna beat you with my brain. And. You know, I remember that stuff uh, on both sides. When somebody's good to me, I'm loyal for mm -hmm. life. I just had there's one main competitor I have uh, in the dice company that is going after the same license as I am. So nice guys like we get along, but we're going head to head. And we were both at the same show recently. And we're presenting to 200 different stores and we both had to present our lineup and our strategy and what we're thinking. I mean, totally tipping our hands. So I sat there, I watched this whole presentation, taking notes, and I'm like, oh, that's a good idea. Oh, I wish I did that. Oh, I could do that better. Okay. And I'm learning a lot as I'm going. And as I'm doing my line, I'm like, I'm going to stay away from that because I want to be a good competitor, not an asshole. So, okay. So he ends. I'm like the next one up. This guy gets up and walks out of the room. And I was so insulted that was like, dude, you don't even think I'm worth watching my presentation to see what I'm going to do. I'm about to tell you my whole strategy, all the stuff I'm trying to keep secret from you. I'm about to tell a room of people and all you have to do is sit here and watch. You're going to win. I don't know if it's this account, but you're going to, your business is going to win. That's how I felt. I was like, hundred percent, dude, I'm going to crush you. Yep. And see me and you know that we yeah. know it. This isn't about feeling good. Those indicators and those moves, there's things that I know about that guy that he walked out. There's things that I know that are going to give him weaknesses in the business. Yeah. Right. I know the gut inside me when someone's beating me in my business, I don't want it thrown in my face. But if I really care about winning, I better dig in deep and figure out what it is. Yeah. I have on my wall, I keep score. So uh, the way I keep scores are loan. So we have to take small business loan to buy the business. And I have what that number is on post-it notes. And every few months, like as we're paying it down, I put that down. And when that gets to zero, I've won. Then I own this company and nobody can take it. And, and then it really gets fun. And then it's fun. Now it's like if shit goes awry, I lose my house. Yep. Uh, theoretically. But, you know, when we get to zero and it's like, hey, now I'm just doing this for fun. Here we what go. do we want to do? Yep. Um, so to me, that's how I keep score. And like because nobody's insulting me anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, Did you change your presentation when he left that slight that you felt? Did you change it a little bit and say, you know what, I'm going to do a little bit of that, even though I wasn't going to? Uh, no, I, it might have. I might have given a little bit more like pop to it, but I didn't. I didn't change it. I I try and um, to give a hundred percent to every presentation like that. And I like I tell my kids, if you treat every opportunity like it's the most important, because to that person it is, and you give everything. So when I go on stage in front of two hundred people. I'm leaving it up there, whether this guy's in the room or not. I might have, you know, 
maybe not tip my hand to like, hey, you know, I'm doing blacklight trays. Now I'm going to do blacklight towers and I got some other blacklight ideas. Like I'm going to sell a million dollars worth of blacklight stuff in the next three years. If that guy had sat there and seen that. He might have taken half of it. He might have taken half of it. Um, just like when I saw his presentation and it was all about dragons and I was like, ooh, it brought me to, well, what about this, this, and this, this? And there were all these ideas I had about dragon scales and metal dragon scales and bags and trays that I wasn't taking any of his stuff, but it was definitely inspiration for, oh, I haven't thought about chromatic dragons were an idea. Um, so, yeah, I was like, I'm going to take this as a learning opportunity. I'm not the smartest person in the room. I'm the smartest person in the room because I'm staying to hear what you have to say. Yeah, why, why do you think we self-deprecate and sell ourselves short and say i'm not the smartest person in the room so we're taught in business school or taught from other people like make sure you surround yourself with people smarter than you uh, okay well doesn't that make you the smartest person yeah i think it's a, a way of disarming the people around you so that your ego doesn't se seem so big i do it all the time i rather make people laugh and put myself down because the alternative is Dude, I think I'm the smartest person in the room. I've been doing this a long time. I'm well educated. I've run multiple companies, and you motherfuckers just try and keep up, right? And like nobody wants to work with that guy. Everybody but it, but it's important that you know that though. You don't have to share it, but if the person in the room says it's my job to surround myself with people smarter than me, you get in my analogy. Then you're the smartest one. Yeah. No. I. And I think you don't need to tell them, but you need to know. I think. Most times when somebody says, I'm not the smartest person in the room, they really do think they're the smartest person in the room. They're just saying that to try and seem humble. Uh, now, maybe not the most specialized, right? Because uh, sometimes I'll be like, I'm not the not smartest person in the room because I need help for inventory mm -hmm. or I need help for you know my finances. But I'm the only guy who's seeing the big picture who can put it all together. Yeah, what so. does smart mean anyway? Like, let's go there. The smartest guy in the room. What are we saying? What does What is smart? <sighs> You know, now that I have kids and they're in school, we have this conversation all the time because there's book smart, there's people smart and emotionally smart, there's business smart, there's specialization smart, um, and so many different things. And, like, one of my kids is really book smart. My other kid is a hustler. And it's like one of the kids I think I'm going to end up buying a company with and running. The other kid – wants no part of it, but I have no doubt it's going to be successful in a totally different route. Is one kid smarter than the other? Well, yeah, in certain dimensions, right? Maybe book-wise or emotionally, um, but they're both going to succeed in different ways. And I feel like smart kind of gets boxed in, and I'm totally guilty of that, of, you know, watching my kids' map test come back and be like, what percentile are you in? And then I gotta remind myself, I'm like, dude, it doesn't matter what percentile you're in. All the other percentiles are going to work for you, right? We are going to – it doesn't matter. Be more pro you and not anti everybody else. Yeah. Right? Um, what can we learn about community from the Jewish community? Because there's something I've seen that – see, I have a different stereotype. I don't have the necessary stereotype in my mind about – I don't know anything bad about anybody Jewish, so I can't have that stereotype. The stereotype about owning and running businesses. Okay, what? But I see y'all have each other's back. Yeah. I, in, a, in a unique, different way. I think that's true. I think it's a byproduct of being persecuted and people coming after you, right? I think you end up circling the wagons and you kind of take shelter within that community because you have to. Um, and I do like that about the community. Um, I, the community is a lot about work ethic and about studying right like they're called the people of the book right and it's you hear all these stories about literally they've sewn the torah into their clothes and taken them over as they're fleeing the holocaust to the u.s um and these books were so important to them and you know even my kids studying for our mitzvah and they're studying a different language and there's a lot of like stop and think and you're allowed to question in their religion right it's not just Hey, we think this. It's you're allowed to question God. You're allowed to question if God exists. You're allowed to question, you know, people's whatever you want. Even you know, and you even see it in kind of the hot topics of the day with current events. Like Jews aren't necessarily one side. Like we're tend to be pro-Israel, but pretty open-minded about. Oh, 
I can be pro-Israel, but not anti-Palestinian, you know, civilians. Like, oh, it's not black and white. Um, so I think you can, I think, learn that and very family oriented, right? So yeah. it's all, I think there's something cool about traditions that get passed down for generations and generations. I guess you still have to be, the funny thing is, is people outside, outside any community, it could be, I identify it similar to, or I look at it, it's, it, I see kids that come up inside Catholic schools. There's a fraternity after they graduate. It's similar. I see them doing business together. I see them, one person's a banker and they're lending to their buddy who owns. And I'm like, I'm not hating on it. It's just a hell of a community, right? And yeah. I'm like, but you still have to be relevant in the community, whatever it is, because there's shitty people in the communities too. Yeah, I don't know if that's a byproduct of as you grow up together and how you, who you meet and who you interact with. Because, like, I don't think if somebody came up to me out of the blue and was like, hey, I'm a Jewish realtor and I'm a non-Jewish realtor. I wouldn't necessarily pick the Jewish one just because it's Jewish, right? I would say, like, tell me your qualifications and whatever. That's what you still uh, have to be relevant. Now, it does give us, oh, I'm comfortable with you. Right. I have some identity with you. This is a little more comfortable. Now, why are you good? Right. Right? Because there's going to be shitty realtors inside the same community. Right. Yeah. Um, so should we try to build our community? If we don't, if this structure of coming from a, Catholic background, where we come up through Catholic schools, if we come up through, you went to Hebrew schools, is it important if we didn't have that to try to build a community? I mean, I think I think community, no matter where you build it, is important. And I love this idea of surround yourself with people that you want to be like, and whether you're joining like EO, the Entrepreneurs Organization, or some, or whether it's an informal group right so i have a friend who runs a pr agency in new york and we're having a call today just to talk about what are the struggles that we're each going through in our own businesses um building that kind of community is important i think and you know i'm a big believer and i said before i say yes to everybody i help people make all their stuff and whatnot uh and it, it'll come back like you build that community i'm a big believer in that kind of pay it forward and I, I always find it funny when the stuff that, I, to me, and this sounds obnoxious to say it this way, but is a throwaway, right? I'll take a call with somebody. I had to call these people who were doing, uh, I think I'm getting this right, the chemo ferry. And it was a ferry for kids who were going through chemotherapy, and it came with a book, and it was cute. And they were like, can you help us? And I was like... Yeah, well, sure. I'm not going to ask for anything because you're helping kids with chemotherapy. I want to put out goodness in the world. I hooked them up with literally two emails. It was like, here is my production guy. He's going to help you. Here's my book guy, my shipper guy. You know, done. Forgot about it. And like two years later, I got a package. It was the chemo fairy. It was a handwritten note that was like, thank you so much. We would not be on this journey if it weren't for you. And like, And to me, I didn't even remember doing it. Like, I literally had to go back and be like, oh, yeah, we had a half-hour call 24 months ago. Uh, was, but, the, was the check hidden inside the zipper of the fair? I didn't want to check. Like, if you're doing chemo, <laughs> I mean, that's the thing is you get to the point where if you're comfortable enough, you can choose where you want to make money and where you want to make a difference. And I've had, you know, I do that. There's a girl who got bullied in school, and somebody pulled out the chair from her when she sat down. She hit her head got some damage and now she runs an anti-bullying campaign and want to make dolls and i was like sure i'll mentor you right um and building that kind of community you know it it fosters positivity good right? things yeah um what makes the sharks different than us oh boy i think you have to also remember it's a show it's been going on for something like 15 seasons. So they don't have the ability to put their heart and soul into every business that they buy. Right. And I feel like, at least for me, the places I'm investing, uh, the companies I'm running, I still can put my heart and soul into, into those. I think as you get bigger and you diversify, it becomes a little bit more like managing a portfolio. And I think, down at, in the trenches, it's more about, you know, armoring up and doing it yourself. Uh, that and, you know, a couple zeros. 
<laughs> is there a direct path? So it seems like, you know how you said all the things on that vacation when you were talking to your friends that you laid out have come to fruition yeah. for the most part. Yeah. So that's a manifestation. That's a going back to the old secret book and all that, right? Is there a direct path to ending up in a seat on Shark Tank? No. I, I don't think there's... A, I think every person has their own unique set of skills, which means everybody's path is going to have to be different, right? So for me to go, it would have to be a toy-based path, and you know, it might be that doing menches led to dice, dice led to board games, board games led to inventing, and eventually you, know, you grind grind out enough of these you might hit the one that's going to be you know eight figures and then you're you're done uh, your path wouldn't be that right so your path is going to be totally different of buying a building doing real estate do you know so i don't think there's one path i think there's the knowledge of like hey i'm different than you are uh what do i dig you know for me it's more important like that path that i'm on regardless of whether i end up financially where i want to be Am I doing what I enjoy? You know, is my family proud of me? Am I having fun during the day? Like, to me, that's still the the barometer of, like, my kids are proud. I love coming home and showing them new toys I'm working on and being like, hey, this, this, this. And there was a point at which um, I got an offer from uh, Pure Romance here in town. And this was, you know, back when I didn't have, it was like that unemployment period. And my wife was like, you can't do that. And I was like, why? It's like just another kind of product. She's like, you want to be a toy guy in the long term. Like you can't work in the adult products industry and make that leap back. And like, I remember being so offended at the time by that comment. And I was like, I can do whatever I want. You're not the boss of me. Uh, but in retrospect, it's like, no, my path really is one of like bringing joy to people's families through games and other activities. I could have brought joy through other so, activities. So, so the knowledge of toys is universal? Yeah, I mean, you know, you're bringing in stuff with batteries from China, so, you know. It's all the same. It's all the same. <laughs> I wonder who thought that that was going to be a good idea on that offer. Uh, I brought them some really fun marketing ideas. <laughs> did you tell your wife that? <laughs> I did. She was not amused. <laughs> um, what do you think? So you're sitting here at 44. What do you think? Do you have the next five or six years planned out? Yeah, I... I do now. Uh, this dice thing, I mean, I got a f at least three years of ideas and building this thing out. And I think what decision I'm going to have to make is there's a number. I don't know. The number somewhere between 5 and $10 million, but I don't know what it is, of where your company gets big enough that you go from people to process and you need a certain kind of person running it. And I'm not that person. Um, a manager versus a visionary. Yeah, that's probably a good way to say it. Or a manager versus a doer. Like, I'm still in there mm -hmm. taking every call. So at some point, I might outgrow, or this company might outgrow me. And that's where I'm going to have to say, like, hey, do I step back? Do we sell the company? Do I bring in somebody else and find a way to tag team it? Um, but for the next three years, I think I can still with expandable capacity, still handle that and do that. Beyond that, I think my next big decision is, do I sell this? Do I want to run this in perpetuity? Do I want to buy another company to merge into this? You know, at each stage, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm content until I'm not. Um, and the funny thing for me is right before I bought this company, our goal was just to get debt free, right? Like just there's, uh, in the movie The Gambler, uh, John Goodman makes. Do you, do you know the quote, John? Good Quoted again, but I think I I think I know one. But go ahead. It, the guy has like two and a half million dollars. He's like two and a half million dollars. You buy your house, you put some money in the bank, you pay your taxes, you buy a shit box car, and you got fuck you money. Boss wants you to do something, fuck you. And I was like, that's just where I want to get to. And I was there, like we we had the house was paid for. We had we're saving for college, like. The pressure was off. We could do our thing. And that was the goal. And then once we got there, I was like, I could do more. And then I threw that goal out the window. It took out a multi-million dollar loan and 
you know, said to my wife, like, hey, we might lose it all, but it'll be fun along the way. And now I keep score, like I said, and my goal is just to get back to zero, right? It's only to be not owe anybody money. And, but that's uh, not playing it safe. You talked about doing a bunch of small things and playing. That's what you did is not playing it safe. It's a calculated risk, right? It sounds not safe, but when you say, oh, I borrowed a few million dollars, but based on what the company's doing, right? I bought based on what the but company But shit could was. happen. Well, yeah, shit. COVID can. happens. Shit can happen. Yeah, no, it, I mean, it can. You you bet on yourself, right? Or if you want to be, if you want to have a vacation house, if you want to be able to take these crazy trips, or do you want to just, you know. Read your book by a fireplace yeah. looking out the window at the snow. Yeah, so you get. And yeah, they're both options. okay, I guess. Yeah. So, listen, some people can tolerate that risk. Some people can't. My wife doesn't tolerate it particularly well. I think it's fun. I think it's part of the game. And as crazy as that all sounds, she still has her stable job. So are we ever going to end up homeless? No. You Your know, home just could look different. Yeah, it might be a little bit smaller house, but, you know, it'll it be It might fine. be a one-bedroom condo instead of a nice home in Amberley or something. Yeah, no, it's going to be fine. <laughs> um, what uh, What would your wife say about you? I'm a pain in the ass. Uh, I'm 10 pounds of shit in a five-pound package. Uh, that somebody like me needs somebody like her. So you have your idea guy and your, like, let's do this guy. But it helps to have somebody by your side who can actually execute and put together the plan. So just like Adam, who I talked about, does all the execution at work, my wife kind of does that at home, and it's a lot of times like me saying, hey, we should do this. You know, we should go to Israel, and let's get, you know, do this, da, da, da. and then my wife has to actually cash the checks that I write. Um, I think that's what she would say. And I think I make her life interesting, and I make a lot of jokes, and I give a lot of attitude. I think I make her life interesting. Um. I think that uh, the tough thing for entrepreneurs, the way our brains operate, it's very unique compared to someone who's not. It's the difference of knowing a what a D20 is or not. And are you at a place where you know that, and it's conscious, where every decision and sacrifice you make, by default you're making it for her too? Yeah, I we understand that. We talk about it. And it's like, okay, we're making this decision on the family. And I didn't buy that dice company without her, right? She was, and she didn't get it. I mean, I remember we, she's like, why do you need more than one set of dice? But she's like, but if you believe in this, like, I believe in you, you know, we're in this together. But yeah, I'm writing checks for both of us. Um, but the sacrifices are different. You know, I, I didn't talk through early days of Mensch when, we were just trying to get it off the ground and I was working a full-time job while I was trying to do this. And I was working at lunch and I wasn't seeing my kids and I was near my breaking point, right? Like very close to my breaking point. And I remember there was a day where target had was about to take their first uh, shipment of menches and changed their mind and said, we one person said that this was potentially offensive and they didn't like it. So they're going to walk away from it. Uh, and I hit like bottom and nearly broke. And at that point I wasn't reading, I wasn't watching TV. I wasn't seeing my kids. I wasn't, wasn't like me. If you come to that point where you almost break, it's actually good. And then you get past it. If you don't break, then you know what your breaking point is. And I'm like, Oh, I'm a little stressed today. I'm like a two out of 10. I'm so far from my breaking point. And like, Hey, my glass jars broke. Okay. It's a four. Let me try and find a solution to this. I'm not near my breaking point. You know, it's uh, it's actually good to have gotten to that point. If you've gotten through it. If you've gotten through it, right? If you figure out where what it's going to take for you to break and hit rock bottom and then be like, oh, all right, I'm not there today. Uh, it's a good thing. And for that target situation, that was another three no's. They said no. Um it was an hour or two. I was at Disney World, and I got this email from Target that they had changed their mind. They weren't going to take match. And that was in the first year before Shark Tank. That was a huge order. A third of my business went away. I sent my wife and kids off to Disney World, and I sat in the hotel by myself, like shades drawn in the dark for like two hours. And then was like, 
fuck, I, I wouldn't take no for an answer any other time. Why am I going to now? And I wrote maybe the best email I've ever written in my life of like, here's why the mensch is great. Here are all the people that support it. Here's all the success. Here's what rabbis say about it. Here's why your person's wrong. Here's how I'm going to convince them. Sent it off and they changed their mind. And then they said they were going to take it. Uh, and a year later, I went on my fuck you tour. Uh, and when I visited Target, I met with their Jewish advisory council. And I found the guy who had submarined it. And I gave, first I gave a whole presentation. That guy came up to me at the end. It was like, I'm the guy who almost submarined you. I'm sorry. I didn't realize your passion and what you were trying to do and what you were doing for the Jewish community. How can I help you grow at Target? Uh, and I was like, dude, you don't understand what you did. And I told the story of me at Disney World in the hotel. It's like, that was you. Like, your actions have decisions. And it's interesting that at some of these big companies, these individuals can make a difference. These young young kids, and they're like 20s and 30s who are buyers, can make this decision. And it's like the decision of makes my year or kills my year. Um, but you made sure you didn't allow that to happen. Right. I. I took that no and I fought it. You know, it's sometimes you fight a no and it remains a no. But like in that case, we I, haven't heard about any of those today. Yeah, I can't think of any. Your wife I married you. I can't, I can't think of any. <laughs> All <but> these other. <laughs> your kid did say you can't be the announcer for now until he graduates. <laughs> Turn that no into a yes. <laughs> he would allow me to if I could put my personality away but, but you can't but i can't why can't you why are there some things to us where like we just can't do because that's not a word that exists in the entrepreneur space you know my wife who's at png and i have talked about this and she's like look you need to have a work personality and then your personality and at, you know you put away the part of you that's funny and your dirty jokes and like you're offending people and poking people and all the stuff that you enjoy doing and then you need to be like straight lace, Neil. And she's like, that's what I do at work. And I was like, that sounds like a miserable existence, right? It's like either you're yourself or you're not. And like, yeah, maybe you don't drop F-bombs in meetings. But besides that, like I you do are sometimes. You are. I do too. Uh, <laughs> Why so, was I the first one to admit that? Well, I already, I swore. I broke the ice to this. So, uh, <laughs> no, I think, listen, there are different types of people. And I think entrepreneurs probably fit in that. Uh, box of you cannot contain yourself to fit in that nine to five box in a certain way in certain environments. Uh, at least for me, working at like a PNG um, was stifling, right? I going into a cubicle for nine hours a day to me is like a personal hell. I would rather work 18 hours a day, but take calls while I'm walking the dog and sketching my notebook and and no guarantee of pay and, and no all guarantee. the failure that comes with it yeah. and more accountability and yeah boy that's a huge would rather do yeah but it's so much more fun and listen I I think a lot of what I found is a lot of entrepreneurs having a partner or spouse that can balance that out so like last year with the dice company I just didn't take a salary the first year I worked full time for free for a year. Um, and my wife was like, all right, that's OK. I have a job. We're going to get through this. Like um, a lot of people can't do that. Right. Like physically, you could not get through a year just not getting paid. So, you know, I'm blessed in that capacity. And a lot of the entrepreneurs I know have that kind of flexibility where you can. I know I talked about hitting singles, but you can take those big swings, because if you do miss, you're not going to end up homeless on the street. Right. Mm -hmm. You're going to be OK. Did she really tell you? Hey, I don't understand this dice thing, but I believe in you, so go do it. Yeah. I got her more comfortable with some of the numbers, but she was like, I don't get it. And even now, she'll come to Comic-Con, and I, I tease her. She's a normie, right? Like she, not, that, that thing's not me either. Yeah. this the, the toy thing, this whole piece. I love going to the cons. I love people seeing people dressed up mm -hmm. in their favorite characters. I love the passion. I love taking pictures of that. And she came, and she was like, I don't get it. Why is that dude dressed up like... That's like, the shit I'd be saying. And I'm like, you don't have to get it. Yeah. I get it. These people get it. I'm bringing joy to them. And look at the number of people surrounding this booth. And, uh, you know, we did Gen Con, which is the biggest geek convention for board games. Um, last year, I just bought the company. And we did some exclusive products. Um, we made limited edition. And they 
almost sold out by the end. This year was my year. So like I did the products, changed them up a little bit. I did the marketing, changed, but made the same number of products, same price Let points. Let me guess. We sold out. How how long? Um, how long was your time window, the others that you didn't sell out? Like what would a sell out? There were four days of the con. Okay, and you and almost it, sold out. And it lasted till like a month after the convention. Um, do you guys work an email list? Uh, with your with customers and we don't, send, no, okay you don't it's okay. all on site it's all on site okay so that was important they sent out an email um okay so you had a line waiting for these things at your booth yeah okay um how many of them were there can i know that there were 350 650 total they were sold out in the first in the first half the day of the first day. yeah they were three hours there you go and uh and now we know, and which sucks because of how much money you left on the table. Mm -hmm. uh, but for next year, now I know I'm gonna now I'm bringing black lights and I'm stepping it up again. And and you'll find out what the level is. Yeah, and you'll I'm gonna, find out. I'm gonna double how much we made. The only way you find out it won't work is until you get there and it's like, oh shit, yeah, that was too much, a little too much. But then I'll, like, it's still an exclusive product. I can mm -hmm. sell it online or you know. So again, it goes to that like taking strategic risks did i leave a bunch of money on the table this year yeah and i talked to my partner adam about it and i was like uh dude we should have made more and he and i bought the company from adam so he doesn't tell me no he says fine and, I, and he's happy you gave and, him a few million he's, bucks he's thrilled yeah and I, he's like i wouldn't have let you and i was like you've never said that to me he's like dude i'm not gonna let you make bad decisions he's like you didn't sell through last year. You think I was going to let you make more than you couldn't sell last year? And I was like, all right. It makes you feel better that even if I wanted to, you would have been a voice of reason. That to is stop good. Me. Uh, that every crazy entrepreneur really needs that person. Yeah. Has to have the person. Now, sometimes that person's still not right, and we're going to push back and be like, thanks, but no. I have uh, one of my best friends, and he's the only outside investor in the Dice Company. He ran all the games for Hasbro, uh, he was recently COO of Barstool. Um, brilliant guy. Love him. Uh, Before, what's his name, bought it back? Yeah. He yeah. just left when yeah. Portnoy bought it back. Gosh, you think that was real? Portnoy goes in the office and that social media he put out. He's like, that guy's an idiot. He has, how many has he written? He's written two articles in four months. You're stupid. I, I think that is. That real. was real? Yeah, I do think. Uh, I grew up with Dave Portnoy. Did we, you? Uh, he's from the North Shore of Boston as well. Is he Jewish as well? Yeah. Of course. So you guys hang together, man. This I is wouldn't a say good we hang thing. together. We're acquaintances. Okay. Like, we were at some of the same parties together. We did Passover together. So if you year. hung out, how's he so angry and you're so positive? Uh, I think it's a little bit of a shtick for him. Okay. Uh, I think he plays into well, it. Well, he does a good job. Of he it. is one of the greatest PR guys I've ever seen. Yeah. I mean, just. He comes across. I'm sorry. He's just an asshole. Half the time he does and half the time is fun. It's like, is he is he really that nasty? I don't think so okay he you think i'm reading it wrong no i think he's playing it okay. up uh, All right. i mean when i was friends with him or knew him it was like you he's know, fighting with pizza days. shop owners yeah but i think he knows what makes good content I get it. conflict makes content i get it. sorry so i got you off track here so you know the, the ceo of barstool oh so yes good friend and i yeah. remember when i came up with match i called him and i was like hey i got this idea it's mentioned on bench it's a jewish elf on shelf and he was like look man i love you and i'm gonna back you on this but this isn't it he's like this isn't your idea this isn't the one that's gonna make you a million dollars and i get that you're passionate about but it's a jewish market it's niche you shouldn't do it and yeah you need those people who of anyone everybody told me it was a good idea except for him when i bought my new business he's the one guy i brought in because i trust him to see the bigger strategic situation over my passion now in that case he was wrong thankfully so the passion yeah so he was able to see past my passion to the bigger situation and give me the advice that was like hey you're not seeing this this and this and he was wrong thankfully because i made a big bet on that and for him that was a quick conversation but as i go into this new scenario i wanted an advisor like that to say hey what about this what about this and he's like that's great that's a huge idea or Dude, you're barking up the wrong tree. You know, oh, I know that you like black lights, but guess what? You're the only one. 
Or somebody's like, hey, you know what? Give you the pushback. Give you, you something, something to consider, right? Yeah. So it's like, make sure you factored that. So a lot of times as an entrepreneur, people will give you positive feedback based on the fact that you're presenting to them. They want you to like them. They get your passion. And it doesn't even matter what you're selling. You know, uh, if if you're selling it in a certain way, somebody's predisposed to saying like yes that's great oh i got a new idea for mike and this microphone is going to be the biggest best microphone it's going to be done like no ever microphone don't you don't you think that's a good idea and it's like yeah man it's a good idea um you need those true people who truly care and they aren't they aren't worried about being a people pleaser or and that's where Kickstarter was good, right? Yeah. Because although I did have a bunch of friends, it also let the market tell me, is there something here or not? Because as I tell people, your mom is going to think that your idea is the best idea she's ever heard, right? Your wife is going to think it's the best idea. Find out from somebody who has no vent- vested interest in you or the way you're presenting it. And I know I'm totally guilty of that because I get so fired up that people are like, hey, yeah, I want in. I like that. I like that. And you're like, they walk away. They're like, that was a terrible idea pitched really well. Um, I'm doing a every once in a while I come up with the idea to do a book study. I'm doing a book study from John Maxwell's 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership or whatever mm-hmm. it is. So we're doing that, and um, it's starting tomorrow with some of the people in my company. And I said, read the first seven. You don't know which one or two I'm really going to highlight in our two hours. We're just doing it three times. Yeah, read a third of the book, and one of the first chapters is the Law of the Lid. And at the end of it, it says, reach out to these people, significant other. Um, your boss, uh, people that report to you, all these people, and have them rate you in these four categories. And so I sent out my emails. I'm sure some of the people that report to me are probably like, what? How can I do it? But I, And as I was going through it, I went, man, the only way that you can participate in something like this, have your guy around you, is if you really want to get better. If you really want to be the best leader you could possibly be, the best entrepreneur, because... If you're going to ask for true, honest feedback from the right people, you're going to get it. Yeah. Right? And I guess you got to be careful. you got to make sure the person that really wants to. And I always want the feedback on my ideas, not on me personally. <laughs> but isn't that a part of like but you being is. a leader running the, the, leading the company? And you need to take that where it's like, all right, I do that with my agency. I do it with my people. Like, what can I do better? Yep. So you know what I did? Where? I took all the ratings. I have. I sent it out to eight people. So I'm still waiting on one. But last night, I wrote their name at the top piece of paper, and I wrote the four categories, and I wrote the rating they gave me. And I'm like, it doesn't matter the individual rating for an individual person. But I took everybody, and I wrote it out a line item. This one equaled 62. Mm-hmm. Adding it. This one equaled 56. And I was like, okay, what's this going to tell me? These people, this one, I'm much better at this because the combination says it. Here's the weak point. Yeah. Hmm. Let me dig in on that. So I don't have to think about this person thought that. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. I just did it last night. The book didn't tell me to do it, but I said, how can I really figure out if they're right? Yeah. And the one that's the lowest ranking, there must be something. Yeah, exactly. Right? And I, at least for me, I feel like I'm old enough. I'm getting there of like, I know the stuff I'm not good at. I try to proactively. My rankings were pretty close. I rank myself. Yeah, I try and surround myself with people who like yeah. Adam and yes. Dave and John who but that's because you want to shore up my weaknesses. But that you, but you want that, right? You're you're very self aware. We're using that word now. Yeah, you you get to I think a point in your life where you're like, I have weak points. Mm-hmm. Do I want to? Sh- and this is like when you get reviews at work. I used to hate getting reviews, but it's like, oh, Neil, you're not very organized. Okay, you need to work on being more organized. You need to work on more, being more organized. They would say, hey, you're super creative. You're you know, partnerships, your communication is off the charts. Well, maybe instead of saying spend your time on organization, they should say, hey, we're going to pair you with somebody organized. And the stuff that you're off the charts on, go to fucking town, man. Like, why are we trying to build up the stuff we're bad at? I know why, instead man. Instead of leveraging the stuff we're good at. Most most organizations, large organizations, they don't have an investment or a reason to make you great. They want to keep you where you're at, man. Yeah. Stay on the ladder. There's already someone else that's designated for the spot above you. Just stay there. Do the job we're paying you to do. Don't get too great in all the areas because you might leave. Man, that's bad management, but it exists. Yeah. I I will say the worst advice I got ever, and I love this guy. The guy who gave it to me was my boss, uh, 
German dude, uh, and I was getting ready to leave Hasbro and moved to Cincinnati with my wife, and I didn't know what I was going to do. And I was about to get promoted to like senior brand manager. I had a clear path to like director, maybe senior director, VP, maybe, maybe VP at some point. If my big mouth didn't get me in trouble, and probably wouldn't have. Yeah. You probably wouldn't have gotten a VP, right? I know. <laughs> uh, and he was like, "Neil, you're getting off track. I mean, you've really got to think about this. Is this what you want to do? You could stay here. Your wife could move to Cincinnati, and you just wouldn't stay together. Or do you even want to?" stay married i mean like you know because you're really getting off track and like for some people there is no track right and i'm so i'm so like disappointed in myself for so many years i was so focused on 18 months from abm to brand manager and then how long am i till i'm senior and now i'm like why did i care i i don't ever want a title again i make up titles for myself i'm the chief dice officer i'm she's chief, chief executive mensch like who cares? You know, it doesn't go on your gravestone. So what we should be focused on, if we're not focused on that path that business school teaches us to be and life, te then what should we be focused on? Being the best every day we can be? Yeah, I guess like for, you know, everybody's different, right? For me, I love business. I love building stuff. I love physical products. I love making people happy. So for me, it's like, how can I amalgamate all of those into a life, right? Um and I thought it was going to be important to have the word senior in front of a title in my name when I was like 23. And now, Doesn't you know, shit. 20 years later, I'm like, oh, why did I care about it? My priorities were wrong. And you just don't know better. Um, With great leadership, you would have. Maybe. All right. You see that difference on it doesn't happen always this way because people make mistakes. But when I see a family of like two or three or four kids. And it's really like three or four. It's kind of what I said about me combining everybody's numbers. When you see three or four kids and every one of them is on point, it's kind of like, that didn't just happen. I'm sorry, y'all. Yeah. It just didn't just happen. Someone did something yeah. really, really well. I'm not saying – I probably wouldn't be that good. But someone did something really well. And I think a leader can do the same thing for people. Um, you know, Jeff Bezos' boss when he was on Wall Street told him the same thing. Yeah. yeah. When he came up with the idea for Amazon – He's like, you're doing what? You're going to quit this job? Look at your path. Yeah. You're going to ruin your life. <laughs> and to that guy, it was great advice. Like, he thought that was the right thing, and that's how he chose to live his life. And, um, you know, it took me a while to, like, break that mold, and I'm so glad I did. So what's the best advice so we can be positive? What's the best advice someone gave you that's not your wife? Oh, <laughs> to marry my wife? <laughs> uh is there one? Is there one that stands out or you'd have to, like, dig deep? Yeah, I got to dig deep. I mean, there isn't. So like, what's the best advice you'd give me? Me, as anyone sitting yeah, in front of you? Yeah, I, I mean, they're so generic, but it's just, you know, figure out what you're passionate about, right? So a lot of people don't. Some people don't have that passion, and that's okay. But if you are one of those people that you're blessed to be to love something so much, get into that right it's so frustrating to me when i see people who are not doing that i have a friend at procter and gamble who has been to probably ten thousand concerts and loves music and lo used to be a music manager and decided to you know stay at his job at procter and gamble and he's counting down the days till retirement when he can go and you know go to concerts and it's like dude you should have gone into the music industry you're one of those people you were born with a passion. So uh, figure out your passion, you know, try and build your life around it. And then, you know, learn to work through rejection, right? I mean, that is one of those things we're so worried about being rejected for so long. And I guess personal rejection and business rejection being a little different, but business rejection doesn't scare me anymore. Yeah. So so good advice, but let me let me push back a little bit on this. You know how that guy told you, hey, man, you're making a mistake. There's a direct path here. See, that's not bad advice if somebody doesn't have the grit and determination. No, it's not. Right? So that, that's the tough part here because there's a lot of entrepreneurs that quit and fail and don't keep going and don't dictate their outcome. There's a lot of people, and I don't know what about their individual situation we're supposed to be nice about, but I just know that 
you got to send your family to Disney World and you got to stay in the hotel room. There's so many times they don't do that. Yeah. It, like, I'm just being honest and just transparent and real. You have to, and if you're not a person who's going to do that, then that's okay. Then, like, you could still, you know, there's nothing, an entrepreneur. Yeah, there's nothing yeah. wrong with, like, going and working at a big company yeah. and being. But who knows not to waste their life and make the wrong decision? Yeah. I, so maybe he gave that advice to 100 other people and it was actually right. It could have been. Uh, he knew me well enough to know that it I, should. I was, you know, there's nothing wrong with taking care of your family, working your job every day, saving up, taking the family to Disney World, not staying in the hotel, right? Going out, buying a lake house. You know, that's a good life. Like, there's no shame in that. And then there's some of us who that would break us, right? I literally could not. I would have a nervous breakdown if I had to go into an office every yeah. day. Um, so maybe the, the tough thing is you got to know yourself and you really you need to read. You need to educate yourself. You need to figure out what's inside. Do you really have it? And you don't need to do it all at once. Right. So like match started as a hobby. Right. It I was working full time when I created match. I after I got fired, I did find a job. Uh, so I was doing both. Right. And I started small and it built. And, you know, it wasn't until I got on Shark Tank and it got enough going that I took that leap and quit and did it full time. Uh, so you, you don't, it's not a black and white, like I am an entrepreneur. It's like, Hey, you can be an entrepreneur. You can open a stall at the farmer's market and do that for fun. Dano did. Yeah. The so, seasoning guy was going to sell a hundred million dollars in seasoning. Yeah. Flea markets. Exactly. And test out your concept. See if this is the life for you. Mm -hmm. You might find, Hey, you know what? I'm not a dude that wants to spend my weekends at flea markets. I want to go to my kid's baseball game. Or you might say, like, every person that buys it and comes back and tells me how I changed the, the way they cook, that's what my life is about, right? And it's okay to start that way. So the whole mess – see, I'm actually sitting here saying you would be awesome teaching an entrepreneurship class. Yeah, I guess lecture. Okay. Um, You'd be great. I'd do that. There, there's a, see, there, there is a system about succeeding as an entrepreneur. There's a system, and it's things that you have done. You could build the entrepreneur system book and call it what you want because you really have it down, man. You prepare so much. There's so many things, nuance about the stories today and me and you talking about the preparation before the pitch, about the preparation before you go on the appointment. That is in your DNA, and it's so critical. Yeah, there are things that you can change and things you can't change, right? And – uh, Shark Tank being a perfect example. Like, I read every single one of their books before I went on. I customized each. I gave them each a mention on bench book and customized on the inside and told how each of them inspired me in a different way. Um, and showing that you care and showing that you understand the nuances of that business. Um, you ship. You shipped them to the media outlets. Right, you prepared for six months and had the diagrams for the big account for D and D before you. Man, I'm I've just sat here yeah. today for a couple hours and I'm like, that's the path to entrepreneurship. The failure is going to come. It is a hundred percent going to show up in moments that you don't want to. They're not the per and you're just going to have to keep going if you're prepared and you take a very systematic approach. I think you can crush this entrepreneurship thing. Yeah, and it's it's about you know risk management, right? And big swings, little swings, you know, how many swings you get and uh, how do you mitigate that you're going to fail, right? So See, that's the thing. That is guaranteed. So I I know I'm going to put out 20 products next year. The year after that, five of those might be dead. Hopefully 15 are still going. How am I going to do this in a way that those five that are terrible don't sink my company? And that the 15, they're good. Great. I can double down on them the year after. Um, man, we could talk all sorts of stuff today. I, I appreciate you coming in. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, man. I'll give you uh, – I I uh, like to say I'm, I'm a marketing whore. Yeah. Uh, I say yes to everybody, yep. uh, which means I have a pretty big network. So I'll give you some advice on some of the other really interesting people uh, that I've met in my travels and uh, try and give you some ideas for guests. Maybe we can drag them in here. What a, the, the challenge that we're – because, see, we're not going to stop either. We're going to keep going. I love it. Right? And But the challenge is, is that in-studio is way better. It is just different than virtual. Yep. So at some point, 
it's going to have to become relevant enough for everyone that they pay to come here like you did for the like, – hey, let me pay and come and see you to the conference, or we pay to get them here. Yeah. Because in-studio is just so much more impactful. The outcome is way better and way yeah. different. So I'm going to figure that piece out. Or you could try and find a location where a bunch of these people are all together, and then you go to them and set up a shop. Yeah, there. and do it for a week. Yeah. You know? Um, the challenge is then, too, is how quick can we get those out and putting it out? But you could figure it out. There's a system to I everything. Got some, I got some ideas. Uh-huh, he does. Um, what uh, – no, no podcast for Minch. Minch could have a podcast. Yeah, I mean, I have tried that. When we talk about where I failed, um, I have failed since day one to get a Mensch animated special. Um, I will not take no for an answer. I've signed multiple deals. I actually have had celebrities on board, um, and it's just it's a tough business model, and I haven't found a way to have that be a success and i think i will eventually i think as mensch starts to hit year called 15 and becomes an evergreen where kids are now having kids and they're bringing it the same mensch back i think someone will at some point say hey you know what we have all these other specials let's do one uh but if somebody from netflix is listening give a call um so you said that when you were on shark tank you said you didn't want it to be a seasonal product. You wanted it to be a seasonal brand. Mm -hmm. What's that mean? Uh, so, Mench on Bench was the first of a number of items, and and we actually have succeeded there. So, I have the Mench, but I also have the Jewish grandmother doll that gives advice called Ask Bubby. It's the voice of my uh, aunt. So, you got eight. Is it like Siri? Oh, it's better. It's my aunt. Oh, you want some advice? I'll give you some advice. And it, I flew down to Florida, recorded her in a studio. It was great. We have the Mitzvah Moose, which is all about doing good deeds. The Dreidel Dog. The Zebra from Zion is all about being the only Jew in the jungle. So being the only Jew in town. Uh, Judah Maccabee. So we have a whole brand built out around Mench on a Bench, where Mench on a Bench is a single item, like... Uh, elf on a shelf started and likewise they've grown that into a whole brand so i think we have been successful in creating a nice little jewish brand this sounds like top people in government all around the country who are jewish and even from israel it's like oh this guy's a promoter of our thing like let's go all in for him it it I does happen so i've been invited to the white house twice to the white house hanukkah party uh we went to jewish heritage night for the mets and threw out first pitch for the red sox uh, for uh, the Orlando Magic. So it, there's been some really, really cool opportunities that have come along with this. All while you were unemployed. Yeah. Well, and your son asked you for Elf on a Shelf. Isn't that funny? It's I could, incredible. I could have just not gone to the mall that day. And, you know, it's, you never know. I get, those opportunities probably happen to everybody every day. And you never know which is the one that, could set off, you know, an unexpected series of events. Which taught you to say yes all the time. I do say yes all the time. All right. Invite me back. Okay. See. See, Dave, he'll be like, yes, get him right now while it's hot. Thanks again for coming in. Hope you have an awesome holiday season. And the eight candles of Hanukkah, is that yes. correct? Yes. Explain to us. So he might explain to us the eight candles of Hanukkah. Explain that. So uh, the miracle is that the Jews battled for their freedom. They won. They came back to the temple, and there was only enough oil le left for one night. And they lit it in the menorah, and it lasted for eight nights. And they took this as a sign from God that he was watching over them, and this is the miracle of lights. And then more oil was delivered after eight nights. So we light the menorah for eight nights to kind of remind ourselves of that miracle and that God was watching out. Why doesn't light itself like it originally did for eight nights? Uh, I'm working on that for a 2027 release. <laughs> awesome, man. Hey, thanks for being a good sport around things. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yep, thanks a lot.